I can do that. Thanks. Thank you, Corey. We're recording and we're live on YouTube. All right, great. Good morning and welcome to the September 20th, 2022 public hearing and public meeting of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. We'll begin this morning by taking attendance and I'll ask our general counsel, Mark Silverman, to take the, to call the roll. Mark. Chair Carroll. Here. Vice Chair Bland. Here. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Here. Commissioner Chapin. Here. Commissioner Chen. Commissioner Devonshire. Here. Commissioner Goldblum. Commissioner Gustafson. Commissioner Jefferson. Commissioner Lutfi. Commissioner Holford Smith. Here. All right, good morning again and welcome again to the September 20th public hearing and public meeting of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. We um, this we will be holding a number of different types of items today. We will first um, have a public meeting to discuss uh, a, a proposal to adopt a resolution authorizing the Landmarks Preservation Commission to allow commissioners to participate in public hearings and meetings via video conferencing. This is an item we've already had a public hearing for. And then we will move to the research public meeting agenda where the research department will propose an item for designation. And then we will move to a public meeting agenda of applications that have uh, for work on designated properties that have already had a public hearing and are here today with revisions. And finally, we will have a public hearing for a, a series of new applications for work on designated properties. And this meeting is being held via Zoom and live streamed on our YouTube channel. So you, if you would like to testify on any of the public hearing items, you may do so by joining the Zoom uh, meeting at the estimated time shown on our agenda. And you can always follow along watching the YouTube channel. And with that, I will turn it over to Corey Harala who will read the first item in. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everyone. We'll start today's public meeting agenda with a general business item. Uh, this pertains to a citywide resolution, and the proposal is to adopt a resolution authorizing the Landmarks Preservation Commission to hold public hearings and public meetings via tele video conferencing uh, in conformance with amendments to the New York State Open Meetings Law, Part WW of Chapter 56 of the Laws of 2022. Uh, and I'll hand it off to our General Counsel, Mark Silverman, to explain further. Thank you, Corey. Uh, commissioners, um, the resolution before you today uh, would allow some of the commissioners to take advantage of new procedures under the open meetings law uh, that would allow remote participation by uh, some commissioners at future public hearings and meetings. Um, the open meetings law was amended in April of this year uh, to loosen up the requirements for remote participation by members of public bodies like the commission. Uh, as you may recall, Previously, commissioners could participate remotely by video conference or telephone, but they what they had to uh, bet their their doing so had to be advertised, and they their um, locations had to be open and accessible to the public. Um, as a result, it didn't really, uh, generally speaking, not just the com our commission but most public bodies didn't utilize these provisions very much. Um, the amendments um, uh, are quite significant in the sense that they now allow, would allow some commissioners to participate by video conference, not by telephone, but by video conference, provided various um, uh, requirements are met. Uh, most importantly, a physical quorum of the commissioners must be present at a location or locations where the public can in fact attend physically. So in practice, that most likely means that there will be six commissioners at our public hearing room. Um, other commissioners who are unable to um, participate uh, physically um, uh, are entitled or can ask to be to participate uh, remotely by video conference, not by phone, but by video conference if they are if, if they can't attend because of extraordinary circumstances, including but not limited to disability, illness, and caregiving responsibilities, um, and any other unexpected factor or event. Uh, we will be defining those uh, further in the procedures that we will be publishing on our website. 
uh, if you vote to approve the resolution. In addition, uh, as I just said, we have, we have to post the procedures for remote participation by the commissioners uh, on our website. We must ensure that uh, with the exception of executive sessions, the commissioners participating remotely can be heard, seen, and identified by the public while the meeting is being conducted. Um, we must ensure that minutes of the meeting involving video conference reflect which commissioners, if any, are participating by video conference. Um, we must ensure that the notice for such a meeting informs the public that video conferencing where will be used and where it is used, the public is entitled to also participate by video conference. And parenthetically, as I explained last time, um, the, you, you, we should keep things separate. Are the commission's commitment to participate by continuing hybrid uh, meetings to allow remote participation going forward is independent of the uh, voting for this resolution. This resolution um, is to allow the commissioners to participate um, remotely and as a requirement under the state law where commissioners are participating remotely, the public must be able to, but it is independent from our other commitment that we anticipate allowing remote participation going forward regardless. Um, uh, we have to, um, uh, the, where, uh, obviously, well, as I just said, where, where uh, commissioners are using video conferencing, the public must be able to participate by, by video conference or phone. They're not limited just to video conference. Um, and uh, it also requires that we adopt a resolution authorizing uh, yourselves to take advantage of these requirements. And there are a few other sort of technical requirements that I'm not going through here. Um, finally, I would note that this, these amendments um, uh, are set to expire on July 1st, 2024, unless renewed. So there is a sort of, this is considered sort of a practice um, uh, process uh, statewide. Um, so that is what is before you today. We had a public hearing, as you may recall, on June um, 7th. Um, one person testified uh, at that hearing and they testified in favor. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right, thank you, Mark. Commissioners, do we have any questions? All right, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, I think we did have questions previously at the public hearing and- We did. So that may, those questions uh, may all, everyone's questions may have already been addressed. So um, I'm going to, I think, make a motion that we vote to approve this. So I'll, I'll read a motion and ask for a second. And Sarah, Sarah, yeah. I did confirm that, that um, you know, this motion has been, has been put, uh, it's up on the website, the commissioner has seen it. You just need to start from the, therefore it is resolved. You do not have okay. to read all of the other stuff because it is quite lengthy before that, but you should read all of the, uh, the text after therefore it is resolved. Okay. All right. Great. Let me just see. Shoot. I uh, had it open and now I don't. So bear with me one minute. Okay. So I. Um, make them. I'm going to make this motion. Okay. Therefore. It is resolved by the Landmarks Preservation that the use of limited video conferencing to conduct commission meetings is hereby authorized in conformance with the requirements of section 103-A of the New York State Open Meetings Law, including the following, that the minimum number of commissioners su sufficient to constitute a quorum of the commission shall be present in a physical location or locations where the public can attend in person that where a quorum of commissioners is physically present at a commission hearing or meeting where the public can attend in person, another commissioner or commissioners may attend and participate in such hearing or meeting by video conference from any location and without providing access to members of the public to such location, if the commissioner is unable to physically attend the meeting due to extraordinary circumstances, which include, but are not limited to, disability, illness, caregiving responsibilities, or any other significant or unexpected event. That a commissioner participating by video conference shall be capable of being heard, seen, and identified, including, but not limited to, any motions, proposals, resolutions, and any other matter formally discussed or voted upon, except where the commission is in executive session 
and that members of the public may view commission hearings and meetings by video and may attend and where pu public comment is authorized, participate in such hearings and meetings in person by video conference or by any other remote means established by the commission, except where the commission is in executive session. That the procedures for remote participation and attendance by commissioners and members of the public will be posted on the commission's website and that the meeting minutes will identify the commissioner or commissioners participating by video conference and that this resolution shall take effect immediately. All right, Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? You may not be here, remember. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All right, Mark, I guess you can call the vote. <laughs> uh, Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen, absent. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner uh, Jefferson. Absent. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Uh, I think it's seven uh, or eight, I'm sorry, eight in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. Okay, so that's approved. Thanks, Mark. And we'll now move to our uh, research department agenda and I will turn it over to Kate Lemus mikhail to take us through the proposed item today. All right. Uh, good morning. Oh, so Margaret, sorry. I forgive me. It's Kate is not here. This is Margaret Herman. She's our deputy director of research. Uh, I think many of you have seen her, but in case you haven't, I, now you have a face to the name. <laughs> Please go ahead, Margaret. Great. Good morning. Uh, the uh, first item on the research department uh, public meeting agenda is LP uh, 2666, uh, Samuel Gompers Industrial High School, now Mott Haven Community Health Education and Research Occupations and New Visions Charter High Schools at 455 Southern Boulevard, aka 462 Wales Avenue in the Bronx, uh, block 2576, lot 26. The item proposed for the commission's calendar is a technical high school designed in the medieval revival style with art deco details by William H. Gompert and Wal uh, Walter C. Martin and constructed in 1931 to 1933. And presenting is Matt Postal. Next, please. Good morning. Located in the Mott Haven section of the South Bronx, Samuel Gompers Industrial High School is an impressive and well-maintained secondary school. Designed in the mid-1920s, it was constructed between 1931 and 1933. Next. The building occupies most of the block bordered by Southern Boulevard and Tinton Avenue, Wales Avenue, and East 145th Street. This is an area between the Mott Haven East and Longwood Historic Districts without any landmark dis designations. Next. Visible from vehicles traveling on the elevated Bruckner Expressway, Samuel Gompers Industrial High School has two towers, a square plan with a center courtyard and elevations clad with various shades of light and dark brown brick. Next. This impressive structure was identified by the research staff of the Landmarks Preservation Commission in a survey of Art Deco style school buildings in New York City and as part of a general survey of Bronx buildings completed in 2022. Next. Samuel Gompers Industrial High School was originally called Bronx Vocational High School. Many sources credit Walter C. Martin as the building's architect. Research, however, indicates that his predecessor, William H. Gompert, was responsible for the school's distinctive medieval revival design pictured in this slide. 
Gompert succeeded CBJ Snyder, who served as the Board of Education's architect and building superintendent from 1891 to 1923. Conceived in 1921 as part of a $25 million building program, the design was probably prepared during 1924 and 1925. The Art Commission of the City of New York approved Gompert's design in December 1925. Next. At the end of the 1920s, the Board of Education stopped numbering schools and began naming them for inspiring individuals. At this time, Bronx Vocational High School was renamed for Samuel Gompers, the first and longest serving president of the American Federation of Labor. Bronx portraits of this important labor leader are visible above some doors, including the exits from the auditorium wing facing Wales Avenue. Next. Walter C. Martin succeeded William H. Gompert as architect and superintendent of school buildings in 1928. Under his supervision, the design was revised. The color of the brick was changed from red to brown, giving the exterior a less utilitarian character, and Art Deco style ornament was added to the towers and entrances. Martin told the New York Times that these changes would, quote, add distinction and avoid giving the school a blockhouse appearance, closed quote. They also reflected the school's innovative curriculum. Initially planned as a general vocational high school, it would now focus exclusively on the study of electricity. It was the first school of this type in New York City, what the Brooklyn Eagle newspaper described as a model of its kind. Next. The main facade, adjacent to Southern Boulevard and Tinton Avenue, incorporates two strikingly designed six-story towers. The decoration, which extends up the front and side facades, has inscriptions from Marcus Aurelius and Benjamin Franklin, as well as limestone and terracotta reliefs that illustrate the various trades that depend on expertise in electricity. These raised white on brown panels illustrate men working in architecture, aviation, drafting, light, mechanics, motors, science, wiring, and woodwork. Next. Above the three main entrances, large relief panels proclaim the school's purpose. There are two bronze reliefs that depict heroic workers standing in front of an industrial skyline, uh, and that's on the left, as well as limestone panels of the seals of New York City and the Board of Education, as on the right. Next, please. Samuel Gomper's Industrial High School for Boys opened in September 1935. The Wall Street Journal reported that it had, quote, one of the most extensive complements of electrical laboratory equipment ever provided for an institution of this kind, close quote. Girls were first admitted as students in the 1980s. The school closed in 2012 and was converted to an educational campus containing three independent secondary schools, Mod Haven Community High School, Health Education and Research Occupations High School, also known as HERO, and New Visions Charter High School for the Humanities, two, number two. Next. Since opening in 1935, there have been extremely few changes to the building's exterior. Other than replacing the various entrance and exit doors, it retains its original ornament, variegated brickwork, and arched multi-frame windows. Next. The proposed landmark site does not include the school's parking lot at the north end of the block adjacent to East 147th Street. Uh, and you can see that in the right image. Next, please. Blending medieval revival and art deco aesthetics, Samuel Gomper's Industrial High School is one of the most unusual and architecturally distinctive public high school buildings in New York City. The research department recommends that the commission vote to calendar it for consideration as a New York City landmark. Thank you.
Great, thank you. I think we do have some questions. Vice Chair Plant, please go ahead. Mute myself. Thank you. My jaw is dropping. I wonder how many of these kinds of extraordinary buildings are still lurking out there <laughs> beyond our reach. It's, uh, it's extraordinary to see this and to see its uh, relatively intact uh, status. My question is these two distinct towers. I'm wondering if, I mean, it, it, it really produces a, an unusual form. Uh, one might even say a slightly inefficient form, which is sort of wonderful to see. But I'm wondering if they had anything to do with the electricity aspect of, uh, of what was going on inside. I mean, like elevators or direct current or anything like that. Is there something that produced that that you discovered in your research? Uh, not so far, because the, um, the, um, the design dates to 1925, which was before uh, the Board of Education determined that it would be devoted to electricity. Aha, uh -huh. okay, I see. All right, so anyway, it's a, it's a beautiful place. Thank you for bringing it to us. Great, any other questions? Okay, well, this is great. I mean, as Matt said, the research department identified this a couple of ways and times. Uh, the research department has done a fairly extensive study or survey of school buildings throughout the city. And it uh, was absolutely a standout among some uh, others that they had identified. And uh, they did a the research team did a very extensive survey of Brooklyn this past year that uh, included surveying every council district. And this also was a standout among all of the uh, sites that they identified in that survey. And so these uh, you know, these two, this property sort of appeared on these two surveys with this overlap and um, it led us to prioritize it. And, you know, we are, we're really excited about the survey work that we've done and hope in the near future, we'll be able to prioritize some of the other items. But as this one really stood out on two different surveys, um, the research team is bringing it to us today. And I hope that we can move to vote to calendar it. So commissioner, uh, our Vice Chair Bland, would you make a motion to calendar it? Uh, so moved. Thank you. And uh, uh, Commissioner Goldblum, would you second that motion? Happily seconded. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. So the Samuel Gompers Industrial High School is now on the commission's calendar and will hold a public er hearing in the near future for its proposed designation. Thanks very much, Matt and Margaret. And we'll now move to our preservation department agendas and I will turn it over now to Corey Harala, our director of preservation to take us through those two agendas, public meeting agenda and public hearing agenda. Okay, thanks. And yes, we'll start uh, today with public meeting item number one. This is LPC-22-11906 an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Queens Block 8059, Lot 30, 233-1738th Drive in the Douglaston Historic District. Uh, this is currently a vacant lot created by a subdivision, and the application is to construct a new house and install a driveway and curb cut. Uh, this was on uh, the public hearing agenda last week, September 13th, 2022. It was not presented and it was read into the record instead. Uh, so public testimony will be taken today after the presentation. With that, I'll turn it over to, to staff to make that presentation. Okay, great. And before we do that, why don't we just open up the hearing now so that we're ready to go and can have a seamless transition as we move through the item. So Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make a motion to open the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you second that motion? I second it. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is open and, and uh, the staff may begin the presentation and then we can hear from the public. Good morning, commissioners. Abby Hurlbut, preservation staff. The application is to construct a new two-story colonial revival style inspired building and install a curb cut at this empty subdivided lot located on 38th Drive between 233rd and 234th Street on the north side of the street in the Douglaston Historic District. 
So the proposal for a neighborhood <laughs> is identical to what was already approved by the commission in 2015 as subsequent amendments. The permit and the approvals have since expired. Therefore, the applicants are requesting a new approval for the construction of the new building. So as noted above, the site is on this lot here that was subdivided from the historic property up here on Bay Street. So this lot is now on the edge of the district across from these, these late 20th century houses, as you can see here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump to, um, this is the plan and the proposed new building, as you can see is a T-shaped footprint. And now I'm gonna jump to, um, I think a rendering is probably better, but we can always come back. Um, just let me know. But basically the proposal is for brick cladding above a stucco clad base and features wood railings, columns, trim, wood clabbered siding um, at these pediments, metal clad multi-light windows throughout the building and an asphalt shingled roof. This curb cut uh, is shown here for the concrete driveway that extends down to the proposed garage incorporated on the side of the building, as you can see here. And then um, let me go back to the plans here so you can see, well, the elevation. Um, uh, you can see the, here's the front elevation here, these side elevations. Um, and then of course, here's the rear with <clears throat> and HVAC units. Um, the rear, you know, due to the heavily wooded nature of the site, uh, the rear will only be minimally visible seasonally, if at all. Um, and just so you know, the, the site really does slope downwards, um, as you can see here, towards the rear of the building. And then uh, let me go back to the streetscape. This is the proposed, this is the streetscape. Um, the commission has approved several new buildings on this street, as you can see to the east of the site. Um, some of them have not yet been built. And then I'll, I'll end it on the rendering again. The following sheets, as you can see, have, have some of the, the details of what's, what's being proposed. And if you'd like to see any of them, please let me know. Um, the applicant is here to answer any questions. Thanks. Sarah, you're muted. Oh, forgive me. I'm talking away and didn't realize, excuse me. Commissioner Goldblum, please go ahead. All right, I don't remember this one, so forgive me if, if this has been answered in the past. All the trim is wood? Yes. The lintels over the windows are precast? Precast, yes. Uh, and the sills are precast? Yes. Um, and the clapboard is precast? I mean, is, 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 uh, is, is wood? Correct. Great, okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? And Abby, the site work is also the same as was previously approved in 2016? That is correct. The driveway and paving, okay. Right, with the, with the sloping and everything due to the, the site conditions. All right, so if there are no other questions at this time, why don't we move to public testimony? So if you're in this meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And um, I'm going to, is it? It's me, sir. It's, yeah. Okay, so sorry, just checking. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa Krasavich to take us through the testimony. Okay, great, thank you. And we're gonna start with Helen Freeman from the Story District Council. Good morning. HTC finds this project completely inappropriate and we ask LPC to reject this project in its entirety. Some of the major concerns our public review committee have are that the propor proportions are incorrect. There's no hierarchy between floors and therefore no hierarchy between window sizes and the use of materials is inappropriate. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. And I don't see any other hands raised. And we did not receive any other comments. Okay. All right. Um, Abby, if is the applicant here, I'd like to see if they would like to respond to the comments. Yes. Uh, okay. Daniel, please, please unmute yourself and then state your name for the record. Hi, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is, is Gino B. Longo. I'm the, uh, the project leader for this application. Um, just in, in response to the, uh, the requirements, uh, we do have uh, a nine foot floor to floor ceiling height um, at each floor. Um, there were certain uh, project constraints regarding uh, flood zone and uh, where the building is situated uh, in relation to the flood zone. Uh, we did uh, try our best to keep the building as low as possible. But um, you know, you know, as I said, with with the flood zone, it did bring the, uh, the the first floor elevation two feet higher than you know we we would have liked. So um, this, in, in addition to uh, you know, of course, uh, zoning regulations in New York City, uh, these are the, the parameters which we had to work with. Okay. So do you want to go back to the rendering or the elevate? Yeah. There we go. So. Um, and I think that, as I recall, last time we saw this, we did we um, discuss the sort of material at the base to help uh, sort of compensate for the proportions given the the height that's required for the, to avoid the floodplain. I think that was part of our discussion last time. I don't know if Abby, if you remember, but the base I think material. You're right. I think you're right. I think that was part of um, I think the way to break it up. Yeah. All right, commissioners, any other final questions? I'm not seeing any questions. I'm gonna see if we can move toward our discussion. Commissioner Latvi, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. So moved. <laughs> Thank you. And Commissioner Goldblum, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion now. And um, so as Abby stated and presented, this is a proposal for a new building, um, which or a reauthorization of an approval for a new building. This a design, height, massing, and material set of materials was and siting was approved in 2016 and the work was not completed and the applicants are asking for a reauthorization today, which allows us an opportunity to revisit it. So um, as, and, and uh, thank you, Commissioner Goldblum for asking about materials. It seems that all of the uh, decorative trim is wood, including the clapboards uh, and the brick is brick. And, um, we have natural materials before us, I think, except for the roof material, which is, uh, again, the commission routinely approves alternate roof materials in this historic district. Okay, Commissioner Chapin, would you like to start this one? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I was a bit surprised by HDC's, uh, you know, rejection of this uh, project because uh, I, it's, style and scale and the materials which as you uh, reflected are routinely approved in this district uh, all seem to me uh, to be appropriate and uh, the architect dealt with the issue of the floor heights um, so I, I don't have any reason to uh, not approve what we previously approved Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum? I, I generally agree with that. I think that in general terms that the project is appropriate. Uh, however, I, I would strongly suggest the applicant work with staff on the details. This style of house is in and of itself as a style historically relatively restrained. Um, and therefore the difference between a restrained and correct version versus a developer knockoff it's very thin. Um, so some things that I would ask the, the uh, staff to work on with the applicant are the, the lintels over the windows, which are out of a can. Uh, it might be better off with uh, flared bricks with a keystone or something that has a little bit less of an out of the box look. 
uh, the um, portions of the of the window lintels also might be explored. They might be a little taller. You know, just look at look at the, at the district and see how they did it. The details of the porch. Uh, the porch would never overhang to the left and right of column posts. It would always be plainer with the column posts. Uh, the door surround is always in a colonial house. The most detailed thing it would have. Uh, cap, it would have uh, capitals on the on the pilasters, and it would just be a little bit more decorative. And the applicants, the, the project is almost there, uh, but it does need to have, be worked on with staff, and the staff can help the applicant with that. I would also suggest that you might consider uh, a stone veneer for the base, or uh, I don't know something that stucco looks to me a little, little uh, peculiar in terms of its visual weight under the under the brick. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire? Yeah, I agree with Commissioner Goldblum completely. Um, you know, perhaps one of the treatments to the stucco could be scoring it so that it at least looks like stone. Um, but the, the real secret here is in the details and it's not there yet, in my opinion. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Bland? Um, I think the last two commissioners speaking um, have said um, a lot of what I would also um, say. Um, this is certainly not my design vocabulary, so um, I'm not an expert here, but I, I think we've heard good suggestions. It seems to me one thing that I, my eye says is that the first level windows are too small, uh, to, to not high enough. Um, they may be wide enough. But anyway, these are things that um, can be done at staff, I think, but critically important, as Michael uh, Goldblum has said, uh, to get right. The difference between right and wrong here is a, is a thin line, and uh, I think the staff can help um, nudge it in the, right, in the right direction. Okay, thank you. Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Lutfi. Um, I agree with my fellow commissioners. I think this is... We did approve this um, and I think it's on the right path. It does need some, it, the applicant does need to work with staff. I especially agree with the uh, comments about the base. I personally would recommend that um, the applicant consider taking uh, the railing off at the second floor um, because I think the whole thing looks a little busy. Uh, and also there's no doorway there. It's just a window. Uh, but other than that, you know, I agree and uh, could approve this with those uh, comments. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Shamir Barron. I agree with everything that's been said. I might add that an, another approach might be also to unless there's a height limit here, which I didn't hear, um, an overall height limit, um, a bit more dimension above the top windows between more brick dimension, rather than having it, um, the windows frames touch the roof line. Um, but otherwise I think it's all been said, so um, work with staff. Okay, thanks. Commissioner hall -Fritzman. Uh, yes, I think everything has been said. So I agree with all the uh, comments of my previous of my fellow commissioners, um, especially about the base. I think um, a field stone base would be much more appropriate than the stucco. Okay, great. All right, thank you, commissioners, for all of your very specific comments. I think that's very helpful. So I think what we can do today is make a motion to approve reauthorize this design, approve this proposal with the condition that they continue to refine the details in consultation with the staff, particularly at the lintels, door surround, porch, and to restudy both details and materiality at the base in continued consultation with the staff. Commissioner Chapin, would you be comfortable making that motion? Uh, yeah, hold on uh, just a minute till I get it uh, up. Uh... And I do agree with the uh, comments that were made. I think that the base would be improved, uh, but with, you know, I'm not a big fan of stucco, but you know, sometimes it's necessary. Okay, 
uh, in the matter of a certificate of appropriateness, LPC 2211906, 233 Drive, Douglason Historic District. A vacant lot created by a subdivision. Application is construct a new house and uh, install a driveway and curb cut. I note that this is a vacant lot created by a subdivision within the Douglaston Historic District and that most of the lots on the street are vacant or rear yards of houses on the opposite side of the block. I recommend approval with modifications, finding that no significant landscape features will be eliminated by the construction of the proposed house, that the footprint of the proposed house will cover less than 30% of the lot and will not overwhelm the site, that the overall massing height and level of ornamentation of the house will be consistent with colonial revival style houses within the district and harmonious with neighboring properties within the streetscape, that the T-shaped massing of the house used with cross gable roof and division of the facades <coughs> into a main uh, brick <coughs> clad portion above a stucco clad base will help the house uh, to closely recall the massing of colonial revival style houses. That the materials of the house will be in keeping with materials historically used in colonial revival style houses, commonly found throughout the district. And the proposed color palette will be unified, compatible with the building design and in keeping with finishes found throughout the district. That the symmetrical arrangement of the facades in conjunction with the use of classically inspired uh, proportions and details uh, for that the for the entrance portico windows lintels and pediments will further help maintain a unified design which is compatible with the district that the presence of a garage on a secondary facade in a subordinate location within the mass of the house will be consistent in placement of such features at modern homes throughout the district that the garage entrance will be simply designed modest in size uh, set uh, toward the back of the house and partially obscured from a view from a view uh, from public thoroughfares by the existing terrain, uh, helping it to remain a discrete present. That the driveway and curb cut will be typical in size and placement in conjunction with the regrading of the site and proposed plantings will be well integrated into the overall design of the site. And that the rear duck and HVAC equipment will be moderate in size <clears throat> and discrete in placement <clears throat> at the rear of the building and will only be minimally visible from a public thoroughfare. However, uh, the applicant should work with his staff regarding uh, the, the placement of the columns on the uh, front porch, uh, the details and um, pr proportions of the windows uh, and lintels and the materials uh, utilized uh, on the uh, base. Did I get everything? Sarah, we can't hear you. No. Sorry about that. Thank you. Yes, you got that. And so it's really, you know, revising the details, particularly at the lintels, the doors around the porch and doors around, the details, doors around. doors around and the materials and details at the base. Okay. And uh, Commissioner Goldblum, would you second that motion? Second. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. With eight in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. All right, so that's approved with the condition you continue to refine the details with the staff. And we'll now move to the next item. Okay, the next item is public meeting item number two. LPC 22-11753. This is an application for a cert certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Queens, block 8040, lot one, 108 Shore Road in the Douglaston Historic District. This is a colonial revival style freestanding house with attached garage designed by AP Wolpart and built in 1920. Uh, and the application is to alter and enlarge the house 
This was also on last week's agenda, September 13th, 2022. It was not presented and is read into the record. So we'll be seeing it today for the first time. Okay, great. So we'll open up the hearing so that we can also review this one in a, a seamless manner. Commissioner Latvi, would you make a motion to open up the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Vice Chair Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The hearing is open um, and the applicants may speak after the staff introduces the project. Um, the applicant now has control of the presentation. Victor, you need to unmute yourself um, and click on your screen. And then you can advance the slides using your arrow keys. Perfect. Um, please be sure to unmute yourself. Okay, why don't I um, stop the remote control so that you can unmute yourself? Okay, Victor, can you unmute? Perfect. Yes, I, I couldn't do it when I was in remote control. That's okay. I will, I will give that back to you and then you can um, just click on your screen again. Perfect. And then if you state your name for the record, you may begin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, commissioners. My name is Victor Dadris, a partner at Dadris Architects in New York. And uh, we're here today. We appreciate the opportunity to present 108 Shore Road, which is a, a proposed uh, addition and expansion of an existing single family residence in the Douglaston Historic District. Now, um, this is a the location, it's on the corner of Shore Road, the waterfront, and Hollywood Avenue, prominent street in the Douglaston Historic District, and this is the existing uh, proposal. The Most of the addition and the expansion is at the upper levels. There's a small first story addition, which I'll show you, um, with most of the expansion happening above at the second, third levels in this back corner of this corner lot. One of, and this is the existing house with the neighboring property, 102 Shore Road. This is the Hollywood Avenue existing house with the neighboring six Hollywood. Probably uh, to start with the biggest or sort of the most uh, uh, important issue to discuss first is this property, this building, this house was incorrectly listed in the designation report. Um, as a 1920 house designed by a certain architect for a certain owner. And that is just not the case. Uh, research is clear on that. We work very closely with the Douglaston Little Lake Historical Society. Um, we've discussed this with CB11's Landmarks Committee, with the Historical Society, et cetera. Uh, this building was actually built in 1955, or actually designed and, and approved in 1955 and built right after that. So this, is, this should be considered not a contributing structure as it is in the designation report, but as a non-contributing structure due mostly to the fact that it was not built in 1945 or earlier, which is the primary criteria. Uh, we also contend that there's nothing that distinguishes 108 Shore Road, which was built after 1955, either architecturally or culturally as significant for its time or in any way representative of the significant architecture of the post-war era in Douglas Manor. Quite honestly, it just does not rise to the level of historic contribution besides the fact that it's incorrectly designated. Here's the designation report. It states 1920, that is incorrect. This house was designed and built after 1955. The architect was not A.P. Wolpart. The owner was not A.L. Daniels. Um, this is a tax photo. Uh, there's informa incorrect information here. I believe here they're saying it was built 1930, estimated, also incorrect. This is the actual plot plan by architect Carl Salmonen in 1955. This is the house that exists currently and has always existed on this site. Previous to this, there was no house on this site. And I'm going to show you that. These are the architect's elevations. These are the exact elevations that we are now renovating and expanding. The floor plans, I can spend time on these if you want, but I'm moving along. This is a Sanborn map, the corrected Sanborn map from the 1930s. This is the site. 
These are the neighboring houses that I just showed you. 102 Shore, 6 Hollywood. The site was empty, it was vacant. This is uh, on the website, the tax map photos. You can see with the dots, you can access tax map photos. There is no dot on ours because there is no tax map photo because there was no house there. This is 102 Shore Road's tax map photo from the 1940s. And I show this because you can see there is no house on this lot. This is a current photo. There's the house on the lot. Uh, the moving along, these are the context. This is our site. This is the existing structure, the existing house on Shore Road, on Hollywood, the neighboring properties on Shore Road and on Hollywood. And in the neighbor, you can see a mixture of colonial revival, stucco, both historic and current, or, or shall I say more recent structures. These are four houses that were built uh, after 1945 that the commission did think were significant. Many of them had historic predecessors and were additions were added to them. And they were deemed to have uh, historic and contributing value. These are houses built after 1945 that we identified that the commission said did not have contributing or historic value. And we find that these are very similar to our house, our structure, our residence. And these were not deemed to be contributing immediate neighbors of our property. So getting back to this is the uh, Shore Road facade. You can see it's a sort of brick, uh, bay windows, non-authentic shutters. Um, sorry. The three other elevations, the rear elevation. And these are some of the uh, features, several of which we are keeping. We're keeping the sort of garage, breezeway, actually most of this Hollywood facade. We're keeping the brick chimney. We're keeping the uh, brick and slates uh, walkways and we're keeping the mature vegetation that was mentioned and might have value in terms of, this is a landscape plan we were asked to create, but we are keeping the mature vegetation throughout the property. There's actually very little expansion of the footprint. I'll show you that in a moment. Here it is. We're actually only a few percentage points of, uh, of coverage, both existing and proposed. And we're actually below most of the surrounding properties in terms of lot coverage. And we are not really looking to expand that much. This is the existing survey. Again, this is the exact house that was built in 1955. This is an existing and proposed site plan. The expansion in terms of site is the rear corner here. Right now is a small collection of uh, young and small birch trees. This is where we will build a, a, a small footing. We're not expanding the cellar level. Also in the front, there's a second floor metal balcony. Uh, the client and our proposed design are proposing a, uh, a more um, architectural front porch and facade uh, uh, pr uh, proposal addition. Uh, just very quickly, diagrammatically, the cell floor not being expanded at all. It's existing and it's going to remain. The footprint remains. This is the expansion at the first floor level. It's basically a larger kitchen. The client is a noted uh, international chef. The second floor basically extending over that, ex that addition and par part of the garage in the breezeway. And the third floor which is also expanding out over for a family room and space underneath the third floor expansion. Here's that first cellar level, no expansion. First floor, just a footing. There's not a basement here. It's not excavated. Here is the uh, first floor level, the expanded kitchen and rear entry over this existing area. The garage is remaining. The breezeway is being renovated. The first floor is being renovated. The porch at the first floor, there is no porch which would, might be historically correct here. The client does want a what will be a covered porch on the first floor and an open porch above it at the second floor. You'll see that in a moment. At the second floor, there's right now this sort of metal five foot deep um, uh, balcony. Uh, we're proposing to expand that over the, the 10 feet that we're doing below. So it would actually protrude a little bit further here. At the second floor in the rear and in the back corner, is the expansion of the master bedroom and bathroom area. 
third floor, that is a large expansion beyond over that second floor, basically with a family room and related facilities on the third floor within that footprint. And the roof line is expanding back. We have gables and we are adding a dormer to the front of the house, which currently does not have that. This is an existing and proposed front elevation. You can see the work is going to be uh, a stucco. I'll get into the details, uh, metal railings, um, aluminum clad wood windows and uh, doorways. This is a rendering from the corner of Shore Road and West Drive showing essentially this facade is pretty much, in, you know, certainly where it is and, and what it is. The expansion is at the second and third floor roofs behind. Beyond, we added a dormer to the front to what was a, a, a gable end this way. Well, this is the gable end, but a shed this end. And this is the porch extension, first floor and second floor coming out more than the five feet it now does. This is a rendered elevation with some references to historic neighborhoods stucco and metal uh, railings, which we're also proposing here. The stucco is a, it can be painted the Benjamin Moore Moonline white, the roof a timberline asphalt shingle, and we're adding some landscaping to the mature landscaping that's there. This is a neighborhood reference. This is the south elevation, basically the extension over the garage and in this area that we're filling and the porch to the front and the covered way to the front. This is the opposite corner. I'll call it Shore Road and the 102 Hollywood side. Uh, this was the existing elevation. We are expanding on the second floor above. And this is a rendered elevation with some references. Again, similar materials. This is the Hollywood side where we are expanding essentially over the uh, uh, breezeway, partially the garage, and adding the dormer to the front, but keeping the garage, the, the line of the house and the existing chimney. This is that rendering. And this is that rendered elevation with historic references of the neighborhood property about a block away on West Drive. And this is the rear, which is probably the most difficult elevation, very tight, very planted. We are keeping CB11 landmarks committee asked us to specifically to keep the vegetation there. And we're doing that uh, you know, as close to 100% as possible. It's the most difficult because of the way the massing happens here. We have worked on this with staff, actually worked on several things with staff the hierarchy of the windows and fenestration, uh, as well as uh, we work with the Department of Buildings. And by the way, it's re received all current approvals, zoning, et cetera. We actually reduced the size of the house slightly to uh, satisfy the Department of Buildings. Again, this is that rear east elevation and some historical references section. This is essentially the addition in section. And this is the porch in the front. Some of the elements, and I, I don't want to dwell too long, but I'm happy to spend time on this as the commission requests. Stucco with historic precedents in the neighborhood and other places. Roofing, steps, window details. And uh, more window examples and precedents. This is kind of a before and after rendering, shore road facade. Uh, this is as close as we can get to seeing it from the uh, south side. Sliding over to the corner of shore in Hollywood, the Hollywood straight on elevation. This is with the context of the neighborhood. We have kept it so that it is not larger or taller, or we think out of context with the neighbors. This is 102 Shore Road. And here we are on Hollywood with six Hollywood, which by the way, not that it matters, but this is the daughter of Peter Angelili who lives in six Hollywood and has done several landmark 
uh, renovations to that beautiful home. And that's it. I appreciate we've worked with staff, we've worked with DOB, we've worked with uh, Douglas and Unlike Historical Society, and we look forward to working with the commission and staff to make this the best it can be. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. All right, commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, so I just, in terms of the introduction to this um, and the discussion of contributing, non contributing, I just wanted to make sure I laid out what our, our job is. So at the um, shortly after designation, the commission adopted a master plan to allow for staff level changes in the Douglaston Historic District. And in that master plan, it identified all buildings that are post 1945 as non-contributing buildings and therefore more changes would be allowed at staff level. And at that time that the commission adopted that, they looked at all of the post 1945 buildings and um, they identified, the full commission identified a handful of exceptions that were exceptionally fine in their design. And so those, they, those are identified as exceptions to the otherwise general blanket rule that everything post 1945 is non-contributing. This building would not have been reviewed as part of that process because it was misidentified in the designation report as being built in 1920. So we, in, in essence today, have to um, look at the existing building and, um, and find that it's consistent with all of the other post-1945 buildings that the commission identified as non-contributing before we can then consider fully the full scope of the changes that are before us. So there's sort of two parts to our review today. So if there are any questions about that, I'm happy to answer. Uh, Mark Silverman can also help answer some of those questions. Um, but otherwise, why don't we move to public testimony? And if you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I'll turn it over to Lisa Krasavage to take us through the testimony. Okay, thank you. Um, and I see a couple hands raised. Um, I'll start with Helen Freeman, Historic Districts Council. Hello, Helen Freeman, Historic Districts Council. HDC has no issue with the proposal to extensively renovate or add on to the structure. However, we find the proposed design to be too large and not appropriately detailed. Our specific, our specific comments are as follows. One, the roof line extension is too massive. We recommend that the roof line be pulled down to the floor level of the attic so that this is in scale with the neighboring historic houses. The ridge height is acceptable. Two, the addition of the third floor makes the second floor look out of proportion and too tall for the rest of the structure. Three, the new roof gable and the east elevation is out of character with the proposed alterations of both the main shore road and Hollywood extent elevations of the house and of historic houses in the district. The roof slope must be increased and the roof line and eaves brought down to the third floor level to make the proportions work. Four, the proposed changes to the garage at the Hollywood Avenue facade do not work. The gable looks as if it was tacked on as an afterthought. The garage doors should be divided and uh, carriage style doors used or a simpler door should be employed. Five, the new front porch is massive and the large stuccoed piers supporting the porch deck are inappropriate and out of scale with the house. A wood porch with more delicately sized members and trim would be more appropriate. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And next we have John Graham. Good morning, commissioners. John Graham for the VSNY. Um, the Victorian Society in New York cannot support the proposed alterations to the house at 108 Shore Road. The existing house at 108 is a graceful interpretation of the colonial revival style. The work you are being asked to approve would result in a structure which is large, bulky, and devoid of any relationship to the historic houses which give Douglaston its character. 
it would be almost the perfect definition of a no style building. These applicants need to walk the area and study the photos of the well-detailed houses they've included in their presentations. The architects for those buildings used carefully designed historic elements which added variety, visual interest, and a sense of scale to create the cohesive neighborhood we see today. That's what these architects need to do before any work can be approved. We are asking you to take no action today and to instruct the project architects to restudy the district and the existing house, review, the way, review ways to salvage historic material or devise new detailing in keeping with the district, reduce the building's mass, drop its roof line, and return with a revised proposal which reflects the character of the Douglaston Historic District. Thank you, commissioners. Okay, thank you. And I don't see anybody else with their hand raised, um, but I would note that we also received um, a, a letter from Community Board 11 um, and their Landmarks Committee um, unanim unanimously approved the project, um, but asked for protection of trees on the property um, to protect them from damage during construction. And we also heard from the Douglas Manor um, Association, um, who also um, recommended approval of the project. Okay, thank you. So, Mr. Dadras, would you like to respond to some of the comments we've heard? We've heard very specific comments about details and proportions. Um, and so, if yes. you'd like to address those, yeah. Okay, yeah, we 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 just, we hear the comments. Uh, we don't necessarily disagree with them. I can tell you that we have been working uh, towards that end. We have been working with staff, and we've actually revised this several times over the last couple of months. And I think we have improved it. And if there are other suggestions that the commission and staff feel would make this a, a better project. We're willing to do that, working with our clients to, to make this an even better project than it is. Um, I can tell you the roof lines are difficult because of the, uh, the mess. If the roofs are much steeper, the third floor that the clients want does not work at all. If we went back to the diagrams of the uh, floor plans, um, it's already pretty small up there. Um, but we are willing you know, to, to work with staff and with the commission, obviously, as I've said already, to make any improvements that you think in terms of detailing or, or proportions would make this better. Okay, thank you. We do have some more questions. Commissioner Goldblum, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I just want to ask, ask you, Mr. Dadris, is it your view that this design is uh, of a style that is, um, like a historical style that you're trying to go for? Are you trying to make this look like, um, you know, the kind of houses that you showed in your examples? Or are you thinking of this as a modern interpretation or a modern design? With this? Tell me how to look at this. So yeah, I look I, at I your... think, yeah, I think that's a good question, Commissioner. Thank you. I, I think, you know, the client's approach and working with the client, they wanted something that was, I don't necessarily want to use the word modern, but contemporary. For 2023, which is uh, when we would be uh, approving and building this. Um, it is rooted in colonial revival, certainly the front facade. If the existing house had something, the symmetry, let's say, of, of a colonial revival, we actually tried to add other elements of colonial revival, like a front porch, like the dormer in the front that might be echoing that in a more contemporary way. So I guess the answer to you is that we tried to do a more contemporary colonial revival. Okay, thank you. We, we were, not try, we're not trying to recreate, uh, I don't, I'm probably not supposed to say this, but the previous project uh, that I reviewed or that I sat through with you guys was more of a recreation, I think. That, that's, I think not, right. that's not what the intent is here. Got it, perfectly said, thank you. Okay, great. Any other final questions, commissioners? All right, not seeing any questions. I think we'll go ahead and move to close the hearing and begin our discussion. So Commissioner Bland, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Leffy, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> All right, the hearing's closed and we'll begin our discussion. And um, I, as I've already described, 
we are we're looking at this building that uh, was constructed in 1955 and the proposal is to expand and redesign it and so um, we'll have a discussion on whether this kind of change is appropriate for this building and within the context of this historic district. Commissioner Goldblum, would you like to start this one? Sure. Okay, so on the first topic, I see no reason to challenge what the applicant has presented, that the designation report was inaccurate and that the house was in fact from the 1950s. Uh, therefore, uh, by the criteria that we used at the outset, I think that his interpretation of the house as being a quote unquote non-contributing house by virtue of its age, uh, I think, and by virtue of the fact that the staff, when they made that erroneous report, didn't identify it as uh, uniquely contributing because of its design per se, uh, I think that that would grant the applicant the license to do the kind of extensive work that he's doing. Um, and I think that the volume and general proportions of the proposed addition are uh, appropriate in my view. Um, however, I think it's when, it's when we hit the issue of style that we kind of hit a bump. Uh, and I think that the applicant's answer to my question was, was a good answer. And it's interesting to look at this in, 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 the, in the framework of the project that we saw just before in the same neighborhood. Um, and in a way for us as commissioners and us as representing the commission, it's a lot easier to, to roll out the pattern book and say, follow the colonial pattern. You know, there's a way to do a door surround, there's a way to do a window header, et cetera, et cetera. What, what the applicant is doing here is um, pushing up against the same problem that that project had, namely a generic um, budget driven aesthetic um, that is, you know, it's, it, I guess I would say style is language. Language is all about communication and if, I'm not hearing what you're saying, then you're not communicating very well. And the way to make this communicate your intention better, I think, is to look carefully at the details and think about how to make this house read as a modern interpretation of a historic style. Look at other modern interpretations of historic styles of which there are plenty to, to, to look at. I mean, you can look you know, across the spectrum. There have been uh, plenty of very, very good architectural uh, 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 efforts over the last uh, 40 years that have done exactly what you're proposing to do here. But I think that the, the problem here is in the details. And it was interesting that the app, that the two um, people who testified noted some similar concerns, even if they came at it from a different direction, perhaps. Uh, one was the <laughs> angle of the roof, which obviously is the existing angle of the roof which is meant to be a colonial kind of uh, a neo-colonial look. Now you're taking it away from a neo-colonial and trying to make it into a what? Maybe a little bit of a Victorian, maybe a little something else. You know, hard to say, but it's sending, a, it's sending us a message, right? It's sending us a message of colonial. And some other aspects of the house, like the center gable or the very heavy front porch, are sending us a different message. So I think you got to look at the, at the house not only as a combination of existing and proposed additions, but also as a stylistic communication device and look at the details from the pitch of the roof to the materials, to the detailing of the porch and that central archway, to the windows and how they're in frame, to the, you know, the, 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 the sills. And all of that is what makes a, a modern house different from a traditional house. I mean, if you were saying you wanted to do a Victorian house, then I'd say, where the, where's the siding? Where's the brackets? And the examples you showed were, were, were mostly Spanish-inspired Spanish, Spanish inspired houses, and those have a different set of details. Those have eave brackets and, you know, stone detailing around the do doors or entrances or arches. You know, you're not doing that. So you got to kind of figure out what you're doing and give it detail. Give it richness and detail. And you can do that in a modern sense 
perfectly successfully. I mean, there are plenty of buildings. I, I'm, I'm, um, none are jumping to my fingertips at the moment, but um, I'm sure the staff can help you identify them that have been successful contemporary additions within uh, historic districts. I know Fieldston better than I know uh, uh, Douglaston, and I can think of a few up here that have been approved recently that were either contemporary versions of a local style, like a Tudor modern or a modern modern. Um, there have been plenty of examples of those that you can look at, and I'm sure there are a couple in, in Douglaston as well, but you got to really sharpen up the details, make it more rich in a detail way, make it more subtle and more elegant and refined so that even though it's of a different style than its neighbors, it talks to the neighbors in a language of, of, of detail and care and richness and style. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Devonshire. Um, I would say listen to Commissioner Goldblum and heed his <laughs> advice. The, um, my, my visceral response to the rendering on the right is <clears throat> because, because of the raising of the mass, it, it appears that what you have created um, mass-wise is, is almost a a Gothic revival farmhouse in the Midwest somewhere with that central gable. Um, and like Michael said, the, the, the language isn't really speaking to me um, in that way. And it's certainly not apparently what you're intending. Above and beyond that, the, the porch that has been tacked onto the front of this thing, and I, I apologize, it, it evokes for me a suburban shopping mall, storefront, sort of generic, massive, massive carbuncle on the front of, of that otherwise relatively delicate building. And so my, my gut feeling here is that you need to go back. You need to really discuss with staff what's going on here. That, that front thing has to has to disappear and be much more refined in order for me to to say that this is appropriate. Okay, thank you. Vice Chair Bland. Wow, there's a lot to uh, already here just with two commissioners speaking. Um, but Michael um, Devonshire uh, nailed it for me. This is a Gothic revival cottage. Just step back from it, blur your eyes a bit and you could see Downing or somebody. <clears throat> Uh, it's a it's a little Lindhurst or something like this, um, and that could be a, a, a beautiful and appropriate um, kind of model to take. But I didn't hear the architect describe it like that at all. Um, so I think um, um, I do believe that this can 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 be done. Uh, in other words, uh, the, the the current house can be manipulated in such volumetric ways to create. Um, a wholly new uh, approach that that's it that's going to be acceptable as a concept um, as long as uh, we get the um, uh, you know the articulation um, much much more clearly defined and elegantly detailed so again I don't need to pick it apart I, I just think I, I get, blur my eyes I, I look at that big porch and you can see gothic revival written all over it uh, the gable front um, I'm not sure this is what this client or this architect wants to do, but that's what, how I'm seeing it. And if that's something that can be done, it's one of my favorite styles, I must say, of the 19th century, so why not? <coughs> in any event, it has to be pushed in some direction with details that make sense. It's not there now, but it could become there with better detailing and a better description of what is intended. Great, thank you very much. Commissioner Lutfi. Yeah, um, the two Michaels and Fred have made um, some very important comments that I agree with. I, I just wanna go back to the uh, original building and say that um, I know it's not, not contributing or non-contributing, but there is something kind of lovely about it in, the sense that the proportions work 
very well together. There's nothing heavy about it. And it's very nicely within the landscape and within the context. So I'm fine with, its, with this uh, not being a contributing building, but I do wanna say that there are aspects of it that I truly do appreciate. Um, you know, again, I, I uh, agree with uh, a lot of what's been said and um, I think this needs some rethinking. And I think one of the very first thing that has to happen is that that whole front porch needs to be peeled off and rethought it is very, very heavy. And it does the structure a disservice. I mean, there may be, there may be more behind it that's workable, but it's hard to know because the heights of the windows um, beneath it look way too high, but they might be cut off in some way. Um, so, and you, you almost can't tell what's there. So I, so I would peel it off and restudy it in addition to looking more holistically at the entire shape and the windows. Um, I also think, I, I, I don't think that, that the, I agree with Michael Goldblum that we don't have to go back to, to make this building look like exactly what's there in the district, but it does need to sit here and sit well within the context and not stick out like a sore thumb. And I do think it would be nice if the applicant thought about using some natural materials in here, like stone. Um, and is there an opportunity for wood somewhere or something to give this, to um, prevent this from looking too austere? And of course, work with staff. Okay, great, thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. I have um, a really tough time with this. Um, because I just don't know what the constraints or criteria should be. Um, and so, I, I mean, if, if there were criteria, it would be to um, identify what the broad features of the historic district are and to make a case for why it is that this new proposal relates to generally to the um, district's character and not, and obviously uh, underscore the fact that it is this, the building that exists was not contributing even though it is nice and, and interesting in its own right. So, um, and, and so it, I think that there is something about the massing of the proposed project that actually, um, while it's some of its details may not be ones that I find um, co compelling, that the massing is actually one that does relate to something having to do with scale in the district. And based on that, I actually think that, in, so if I define that that's kind of one criteria that might allow for it to relate, I think that, um, as others have noted, perhaps with some refinement, I think I can almost prove it as it's presented because, I, you know, we have to settle somewhere. I mean, alternatively, they have to go completely back to the drawing board and I don't myself feel that I think it's appropriate to give them design instruction in detail. So I am tending towards finding what is being presented generally to be almost appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Holford Smith. Um, yes, well, this is a this is a difficult one. Um, I agree with pretty much all that has been said before. Um, I do think that this could be a more modern ish contemporary version um, of a revival style, but that it's not there with its details um, or proportions yet. Um, you know, rather than repeat what's been said before, the one thing that I would, that's, that sort of stands out for me is what seems to be like this plinth they've created that 
takes the porch and wraps it around the building. Like sort of is seems to be a very foreign element uh, rather than have the building sort of sit in the landscape. Um, it's sitting up on this plinth. Um, so I mean, that's just one comment that I thought I could add to the others that have come before me. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, okay, I'll start by saying I, my, uh, I agree uh, particularly with Commissioner Goldblum and Devonshire and also uh, Commissioner Bland to an extent. But um, the thing that struck me about this first is, you know, I don't really find a resonance with the district in the design. And obviously, and also as has been stated by others, the consistency of the style's message. Uh, the district is characterized by colonial revival, Tudor revival, English cottage, arts and crafts, and Mediterranean revival. Mediterranean revival might kind of uh, work for this uh, with the use of, it, 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 as uh, I think Commissioner Goldblum po uh, pointed out, they were he was looking the examples with the stucco had a Spanish character to them, and I and so going in that direction, or maybe in the cottage direction, but it's not really Victorian cottage you see in this district. It's it's cottage cottage, English cottage. And either one of those uh, certainly would be a possibility as something uh, to modernize or any of the styles that I just referred to. Um, the Gothic aspect of this, I think is, is part of the problem. Um, the, but what really needs to happen is you feel as Commissioner Lofty was saying that the this needs to sit in the district comfortably and have a relationship with some of the, with the other architecture. It could even be a even more modern building if it resonated with I guess some modern examples. But the bottom line is it the architecture that we don't have the sense of consistent message about the architecture and uh, how that fits with other examples in the district because the examples being shown really aren't don't don't go with this this example that's being presented to us I do think the volume is okay I do think they can extend it uh, particular things that I found troubling were like other commissioners the porch which seems very heavy the garage and the way it, 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 it fits into the addition. Um, but, you know, you have to come back to the base issue, which is what is the character of this architecture here? If we're coming off something in the district and then modernizing it, what is that? Where are the examples? And hopefully uh, the staff can help the uh, applicant with that. Um, and I hope by changing details, they can do that, but I'm not sure uh, because I feel that it's, it's departed a lot from a, a, an architectural example one could find in the district. Um, so <laughs> I hope I'm being helpful. Yes, that was very helpful, thank you. Okay, so I think where we are today is um, we have a general consensus that the building can fit within the group of 19 or post 1945 um, non-contributing buildings. However, we've noted some notable uh, nice things about proportions on the existing building. And, um, but that conceptually the idea of enlarging and redesigning it would be found appropriate, but that the applicant has to really focus on uh, the pr a particular style. And uh, even if, it, if modernizing or doing a contemporary version of that style and really study the details and proportions and think about how that would apply 
in a very specific sense to and to uh, setting and sense to this building so that it fits comfortably within the context of the historic district and speaks to its neighbors on either side. So we'll take no action and we'll ask the applicant to continue to work with the staff as they study some of the designs and styles in the district and think about what their approach will be. And if they wanna to continue to think about a contemporary version of that, how to study those details and employ them in a, a, a new design that you can bring back as, uh, as soon as you're ready and we'll review it in the future. So we'll take no action today and we'll move to the next item. Thank you. Okay, the next item is public meeting item number three, LPC 22-08731, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 5739, lot one, 6301 12th Avenue, AKA 6301 to 6323 12th Avenue, 1202 to 1216 63rd Street and 1201 to 1215 64th Street, the Angel Guardian Home Individual Landmark. This is a Renaissance Revival Beaux-Arts style orphanage building designed by George H. Streeton and built in 1899 with additions built circa 1910. The application is to remove religious iconography, including crosses and stained glass, replace entrance and fill in windows, construct a rooftop bulkhead and courtyard additions, install rooftop mechanical equipment and railings, modify and remove ironwork, install a fire stair and ramp, alter the hardscape and boundary walls and install signage and light fixtures. This was last presented at the public hearing of August 2nd, 2022 and no action was taken at that time. Uh, we will now turn it over to the applicant after we open the proceedings. Okay, thank you very much. All right, commissioners, we're just going to have to make a motion to open the proceedings. So, Commissioner Halford Smith, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, uh, the applicant may uh, speak now. Uh, as they present them and they can present the revised changes. Thank you, Chair Carroll. Thank you, commissioners, for asking us back to this public meeting. I'm Harry Kendall with BKSK Architects. I'll be assisted in this presentation by my colleagues, John England of BKSK Architects and Yakov Rothman of um, BDF Design. Uh, we've worked together to make changes that were suggested, and, and we thank the commission for a, a productive discussion in the last public hearing. I'd like to um, especially thank um, James Rosiello and Carolyn Kane Levy, and by extension, um, the se senior staff and Chair Carroll for working with us in, in the over the last month and a half. Um, some of you may remember Yeshiel Siegel's lovely introduction to Guri Shiva and its and its mission, where he spoke of them as having a culture of kindness. I th I think um, I would like to add that. And I hope the commissioners agree that their leadership has also demonstrated a cultural thoughtful decision making in the in the last month and a half um, as they um, they've been questions been posed about the maintaining a balance between their responsibility to maintain the building's historic integrity uh, for them to meet their budget and for them to ensure the safety of their students. So um, we'll we'll address the, the outstanding issues and with and with I, I'd like you to keep all those concerns in mind. Uh, next slide, please. Um, on the right, we see the essentially the seven issues that we took from the, the, the discussion during the public hearing. The first three, the elevator bulkhead, the front planting and place surface and the signage are the, the sort of big three that, that we will treat uh, in, in the forthcoming slides. And the other four items, the change to the entrance doors, attention to the copper elements, Lighting and security equipment in the front yard, especially, and on the on the facades, and the um, future of the stained glass windows will also be discussed. They're they're sort of interwoven. They're mentioned as they're shown well on the slides, but the 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 first three topics are sort of begin and uh, end the the presentation. There's one more issue that wasn't really discussed: is that we as we've had a month and a half to continue to refine the mechanical design. The amount of equipment in the rear yard has expanded slightly. So we'll, we'll at the risk of ending with a whimper, we'll, we'll show that expansion at the, at the end of this presentation. Next, please. Starting with the elevator bulkhead 
on the left, you see what was previously proposed in the, the middle or toward the right, uh, what was now being proposed. We reduced the height by, um, by about nine feet. Um, more importantly, we've been able to contain the, what um, is visible as the elevator bulkhead extension um, within the slope of the mansard roof and not rising above the top to the, to the gradual hip above. We haven't shifted the ele elevator location, which was one of the commissioners among the commissioner's suggestions. The, the plan works, it's, qu it's quite a complicated puzzle and it works very well as it is, but by by um, not servicing the partial attic floor, um, which, which is perfectly possible in, in the, the way we've reprogrammed it so it doesn't require handicapped access. And if it ever does in the future, they can do an internal lift um, was, a, was a way to um, completely change the visibility of this bulkhead. So to the left, we see that it was originally proposed to rise 13 feet, 30 feet, 10 inches above the, uh, where it first um, penetrated the roof. Now it rises, it's proposed to rise five feet about. And more, even more importantly, the visible width is at a maximum three foot three inches rather than the 11 feet that had been proposed. So that's a um, substantial change that's right off the bat. Uh, next slide. The, um, so you see on the left renderings of what was previously proposed and on the right, um, that the elevator bulkhead is visible. It, it, you see the sample photo on the right. It will be a vertically seamed zinc, which will weather to a tone that which we think is quite similar to the roof. We've shown it a little different so that you can pick it out in these, in the, in these renderings. As before, there are two rooftop fans that are slightly visible on the, in the shallow hip above, um, above the eave. They're a little bit more visible as we reduce the elevator bulkhead, but they still, I think, fit the criteria of being minimally visible. Um, if we can go back one slide, I meant to mention, it's a little hard to pick out, but on the bottom right drawing, where it says proposed roof mounted light fixture, uh, we'll be talking about light fixtures, but we're proposing um, mini spots on be, below the eave of the of the um, beginning of the mansard, lighting from all four sides of the building, lighting the mansard roof so it kind of glows subtly um, and maintain and um, reflects the presence of this new institution. Um, we'll, we'll show you more images of that, but I wanted to point out where those, where these existing light fixtures are. Back to the, the, the previous slide. And we'll return to this, as I said at the end, but just to orient yourself about the, from the top images from the left to the right, the change in the height uh, or the um, lack of setback of the mechanical equipment in, that's above the non-historic one-story addition existing to um, below the smokestack is um, is a change we'll be we'll be discussing next. So on to um, the. The signage and the, and the school logo, just to orient everyone with it, with general elevations. Um, above is the previously proposed elevation. Um, highlighted in blue is the what was the name of the school and the um, and the um, uh, other uh, language about what the school's mission was uh, uh, um, between the second and third floor windows. Also coded in blue, a little less noticeable on the. The, there were pin-mounted letters above the archway of the main entrance. Um, looking below, the, the lettering, we'll see a translation on the next page, has been shortened substantially, um, main, the same location, and the, um, the lettering on the archway has, has been removed. And we're also highlighting the, um, the school logo, which has been enlarged ever so slightly in order to fit over and around the uh, existing terracotta detail and be reversible and uh, attached by concealed fasteners. Uh, so that's the, the blue highlighting. The yellow highlighting is the main entrance door and the two not visible from the street um, lowered side entrance doors. We um, not shown in this elevation, but there are two 
street entrances on the to, around the corner to the left and around the corner to the right. Um, we've changed those doors to be a, a more of a similar pattern to the historic doors. We'll, sh we'll show you more of that. And the green coating is um, cameras and security equipment and speakers that were supposed to be mounted on the building at the first floor. They've, they've all been removed, um, not coded, but slightly visible are, were um, mini spots that were between each window on the first story windows and the third story windows. Um, they have also all been removed fr from, the, from the main facade. Um, the dark lines on the wings of the um, on on either side, you see that there's a few more dark lines on the um, proposed than than on the existing above. They're, those are the that we've resurveyed carefully the copper elements of the building, and as before, but just represented a little more clearly, there every bit of copper that has survived um, on the decorative cornices and eaves of, of the building. Um, will be restored or um, uh, or renovated or, or replaced, and um, the the copper retreating is this kind of sacred thing. We'll see it in renderings coming up, but the um, there are no surviving salvageable copper leaders. We'll be replacing all the leaders in the building, removing a few scraps of copper, but none of it serviceable. And the the new leaders will be aluminum painted to simulate a copper patination. We'll see that in renderings. Next, please. So the, the, these renderings show the previously proposed above, the, the, the currently proposed below, the change in reduction of the, the lettering on the, between the second and third floor. The, uh, now it's the, the name of the building is reduced to or just shortened to be the, the name of the donor as, as a building name. Um, likewise, you can see that the, um, uh, the, the lettering on the archway above has, has disappeared and the plaque is read similarly to what, uh, what it did before, but it's attached a little more carefully. Take a moment to look at this and see that the, we'll be talking about the front play yard surface material in a few minutes. The, I want to emphasize with these renderings that the, um, the play yard is essentially invisible from the street through a combination of stone walls, stone piers, um, ironwork, and privet, evergreen privet hedge. So um, we take the, the planted nature of the front yard seriously, and we've um, looked very carefully at the trees, but um, I want to make sure that that is, is understood. So next, please. Let's refer to my notes more carefully. Okay, briefly, this is just zooming in on the detail that we showed looking first at the left rendering. The, the doors, we're not showing what we, we showed previously, but now the doors have a reduced glazed area and an opaque lower recess panel. Um, it's their aluminum doors. They'll be finished with a darker bronze. And um, you can see there was some discussion before about whether we were changing the detailing above the, uh, of the arch or not. It's, it's rendered more accurately now. And you see the plaque, which is an FRP um, um, was painted lettering plaque proposed to be installed above the terracotta as I said before, re reversible. Um, the, this um, discussed somewhat in the previous public hearing, the bluestone steps, um, we're showing now a very a simpler railing that attaches minimally to the existing bluestone cheek walls. Those cheek walls are to be raised slightly in order to come to the level of the new bluestone landing that gives it more gracious area in front of the doors needed for the safety of the children. The bluestone stairs as they exist now are heavily worn. More importantly, they're all of different size. The step heights are, are, are differing and you know, not safe. So we're proposing in, entirely new quarried bluestone steps with an identical configuration as 
uh, as before, except that the front, the, the top landing is pulled out to make for, for a, a safer landing. The renderings to the right, the two renderings to the right show the side entrance doors, which, which weren't illustrated on the overall front elevation that we, we showed before. And they are they follow a similar pattern to the new front entry doors. All, all the entry doors in the building are now uh, aluminum doors with a dark bronze and a reduced glazed area, solid panel. On the, on the side entrances, the lettering, the pin mounted lettering on the brick and the pin mounted lettering lighter colored on the, um, on the darker transom are, remain pretty much as shown before. Uh, and we're not seen as a, uh, as a problem. Next, please. So back to the front yard and looking at it in plan above, we, we were proposing to retain four trees. I call your attention to the tree on the, on the right-hand side. Um, the, a more careful tree survey showed that that tree was um, really at the end of its life and endangering the building. So we're proposing that to be removed. But in the meantime, we're saving, all, retaining all the trees that would lay close enough to the perimeter to allow for a decent play area. Um, and so now you see that the six, six trees are retained, whereas before we were showing four trees. Um, the light posts are, um, there were 18 light posts proposed before as shown on the top. They were to be 12 feet on the perimeter and 10 feet high on the path and in front of the building. We've reduced that number to 14. The lights are doing a kind of double and triple duty. The light poles are doing this, uh, serving extra purposes of containing cameras um, on, the, on the pole and, um, and, and uh, speakers as, as needed to direct the children in, in the yard. They're, they're rising in height a little bit to, um, to 15 feet and on the perimeter and 12 feet on the path and in front of the building. They, um, they, they work a little better than before, I think, in, in terms of defining the perimeter and the, uh, and the path around. And we've, um, as, as before, we're saving the approximately four and a half foot wide privet evergreen hedge around the perimeter. And we're expanding that planted zone with approximately three feet of um, additional grass border and wrapping that border around um, all sides and in between the, the building path um, that parallels the front facade, allowing a couple of entrances into the play areas. There's a, um, as, as before, there's an ironwork fence proposed between the youngest children's play area to keep them safe and able to be monitored easily. That fence runs between new, the new light poles, so it, it never touches the historic fence, though it kind of simulates it. And, um, and the play surface, where there's a lot of discussion before about turf versus um, poured in place rubber. Uh, we're, we're, we're proposing a poured in place rubber, though we, we will be working with staff, as I see it, to, uh, to do a green mix that does a good job of simulating lawn and maintaining a sense of a whole planted front area. The detail on the bottom right shows that we were doing a, a, a crushed stone base, a four to 10 inch um, underlayment and a topper a little bit less than an inch of the, of the um, rubber nuggets that, that make up this, this display service. It's, it's safe, it's maintainable, it has a long life. And I think we can, where it won't look like turf, it will look like um, a green surfacing and, and be, um, allow the, the, the uh, play to be done as safely as possible. I think that's everything I wanted to cover on that sheet. Next. This is the ending with a whimper that I alluded to. Um, the, on the left, you see that we had proposed a two levels 
of, of dunnage with mechanical equipment stacked on, on top of it, um, recessed a little bit on the second level. Further examination showed we needed both levels to be the same width. And uh, um, it is in the rear yard. It is somewhat visible as shown in the next slide. Um, I should note that the visibility we demonstrate here um, is um, it, it's reduced by the recently completed residential development uh, on, on the right, shown a little clumsily in the, in the rendering. But um, it, um, as, as you walk from it toward the, toward the avenue, um, the, the mechanical equipment will be visible, but all on, on the least historic part of the building in conjunction with the, uh, with the smokestack showing a kind of utility zone. And I, th I think that's the last slide. We welcome your questions. Great, thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? All right, not seeing any questions. Let me just check to uh, see if we've received any additional letters. All right, no, we did not. No additional comments came in on the revised proposal. Okay, commissioners, so if there are no, any, no questions, we'll go ahead and begin our discussion. So I'm sending you all requests to unmute. <clears throat> and so um, as was presented, the you know, three big main topics that I think most people touched on last time were the visibility of the elevator bulkhead and the treatment of the play surface in the front yard, um, many suggesting that it be reconfigured to allow for a border all the way around of, of real grass. Um, others talked about trees in the area, in the front yard as well. And, um, and the third big item was reducing the signage, uh, which has been reduced in the, the, uh, at the door, it has been removed from the proposal. And other comments also focused on reducing the number of light poles and security cameras and um, adding solid panels in the doors. And uh, I think some other similar details. So the applicant today has presented a revised proposal with a much reduced elevator bulkhead, has presented a redesign of the reconfigured front yard, um, and then also shown us the reduction in signage, uh, changes to the door details, and reduction in light poles and security cameras. So we'll have a discussion and see if all of these changes have addressed our comments. Commissioner Bland, would you like to start this one? Um, I will, of course. Um, um, I think the changes, uh, particularly the elevator bulkhead change, <coughs> has all of them have satisfied my thoughts um, on the first go round. So I'm ready to vote yes and approve it as appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. Yeah, I don't think I was here for this meeting, but, um, <laughs> but I have been uh, looked at the changes and they all seem very appropriate to me. Okay, great, thank you. Commissioner, I think Commissioner uh, Barron is not with us. So, Commissioner Holford Smith. Uh, yeah, I don't think I wasn't here for the previous presentation yeah. either, but um, it does seem like um, all the comments that were addressed, I mean, that were <clears throat> brought up were addressed very well. Um, so, I, I think it's all appropriate and can find it um, approvable. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, I was here the first time. I, I felt that the uh, this uh, reuse has really been done in general very sensitively, and I was very pleased about that. I think that this uh, these changes have improved it, and uh, uh, particularly the elevator bulkhead, as Commissioner Bland said, uh, the reduction of that, the reduction in signage, and uh, consolidating some of the light and other uh, lighting and other features. Uh, and the front yard changes, I, I think are all uh, 
a plus. So I am happy to present uh, approve this as presented. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Goldblum. Um, I, I too agree that it's generally uh, significantly improved. The only concern I have is for the for the big sign over the on the front facade. I think in the absence of any record of there having been uh, signage of that scale in that location, I just think it's it's kind of on an architectural scale. Um, it really changes the the kind of the whole. Uh, way the building is read, and so I would I would uh, ask them to work with staff to relocate that to somewhere lower down, maybe on the perimeter fence, or uh, I just think that it's kind of at a, at a scale that really impacts the entire reading of the front facade of the building and should be uh, eliminated or, or or moved somewhere out of uh, less prominent. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Devonshire. I think it's appropriate. Okay, so it looks like we have enough to vote for the uh, proposal as presented today, but we can ask them to continue to explore the um, the location of the signage, but I think we have enough votes for it as presented. They did reduce it from last time, and I think as it was always an institutional building, I think some signage is okay in that location. So um, why don't I go ahead and read this motion for us. All right, in the matter of docket number 2208731-6301 12th Avenue, the Angel Guardian Home and Individual Landmark, a Renaissance Revival Beaux-Arts style orphanage building designed by George H. Streeton and built in 1899 with additions built circa 1910. This is an application to remove religious iconography, including crosses and stained glass, replace entrance infill and windows, construct a rooftop bulkhead and courtyard additions, install rooftop mechanical equipment and railings, modify and remove ironwork, install a fire stair and ramp, and alter the hardscape and boundary walls and install signage and light fixtures. And I recommend approval finding that the proposed work will facilitate the adaptive reuse of the building from Catholic or from a Catholic orphanage, a Jewish yeshiva and religious icons, including cross finials and stained glass will be carefully removed and salvaged for possible reuse at different religious properties. That the installation of a new signage panel over the central entrance terracotta cartouche with religious iconography will be preserved, will preserve this original feature in a reversible and non-destructive manner while allowing for the new use. That the new signage at various entrances, including plaques and pin mounted letters is modest and will be installed without causing damage to historic fabric, that the stained glass windows, almost all of which contain religious iconography will be removed in their entirety and donated for future reuse off site and will be replaced with clear glass windows that harmonize with the building's overall fenestration in terms of material operation, configuration and finish, thereby facilitating the adaptive reuse of the building. That the installation of a poured in place rubber play surface in a green color at the front yard will create usable children's play areas. And that the retention of hedges and trees and the installation of grass edging will maintain a verdant front yard as seen from the street, that the proposed lampposts are simple and neutral in design and finish and their height, number and placement will not call into attention to themselves or detract from the building or site. The lampposts will also serve as, a mount, as mounting poles for security cameras building and building up lit light fixtures, allowing these elements to be attached to something other than the building facades, that the proposed location and design of the low pro profile metal clad elevator bulkhead at the corner of the mansard roof will not disrupt the special character of the roof or call attention to itself, undo attention to itself, that the rooftop mechanical installations will be located at the least visible locations possible and will not detract from the significant architectural features that the two tiered platform of mechanical equipment at the roof of the rear extension will concentrate most of the building's mechanical units at a secondary facade and an area that is largely unseen from the public thoroughfare. There's a construction of a ramp at the 63rd street wing and installation of railings, removal of a window and, and 
and masonry to create new openings in the boundary wall and facade will enable barrier free access in an unobtrusive manner and that the new ramp cheek wall and railings will match the materials of the historic will match the, the historic materials that the removal of the two of two granite steps lowering the granite threshold and the replacement of non-historic entrance in fill at the 64th street wing will enable barrier free access in a discreet manner and historic transom ironwork will be retained that modifications to the boundary gates along 12th avenue including relocating the decorative metal piers and installing new wider matching gates to accommodate greater circulation and installing signage plaques at the masonry piers will maintain the overall character of this feature that the rebuilt regraded steps leading from the gates to the central entrance will retain the his will retain the historic fabric of the granite cheek walls and that the new railings flanking the central path will match the historic boundary railings and will meet code requirements that the re that rebuilding the main entrance steps to feature bluestone a bluestone landing, raising the decorative bluestone cheek walls, installing simple metal handrails, and replacing the calamine entrance infill with paired metal doors is necessary to bring this en entrance to code and will reuse as much historic material as possible to feature and feature details recalling the historic infill. That the proposed modifications and infilling of the rear facade openings will rationalize the fenestration pattern along the existing floor plates and central stair exposed by the demolition of additions located off the landmark site. That the proposed infill addition in the recess between the main building and the 64th Street wing will be set back to preserve the historic stone coining. That the light court between the main building and the 63rd Street wing will be infilled with an addition that is not visible from any public thoroughfare. And that the work will not disrupt any significant historic fabric or features. That regrading the stairs at the 62nd Street wing basement entrance and excavating the rear yard to regrade the stairs at the 63rd Street wing basement entrance will enable easier access to these entrances and will not conceal significant architectural features and will and will infill exposed areas with matching masonry. With the removal of the decorative ironwork and the two gates at the front yard between the wings and the main building will be limited in scope and will not detract from the overall site given their setback locations and relative scale. And that the cumulative effect of the proposed work will enable adaptive reuse of a very large, long, unoccupied institutional building will not detract from significant, the significant architectural character of the building or disrupt the overall composition of the primary facades and rooftop. All right, and Vice Chair Bland, would you second that motion? Second. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Not present. Uh, Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. The seven in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. Okay, so that's approved, but we would ask you to voluntarily continue to explore uh, signage locations that might uh, allow for uh, eliminating or reducing the signage on the facade. Okay. We, we'll we certainly will. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. We'll move to the next item now. Next item is public meeting item number four. LPC 22-08431, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1163, lot 119, 229 West 71st Street in the West End Collegiate Historic District Extension. Uh, this is a row house built in 1884 and then altered in 1946 to 48 with a new facade attributed to Irving Kudroff. Uh, and the application is to substantially demolish the existing building and construct a new building. It was last presented at the public hearing of July 19th, 2022, and no action was taken at that time. Uh, we'll turn it over to the applicants after we open the proceedings. Thank you. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to, Vice Chair Bland, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? So moved. Thank you. Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you second that motion? Second. 
All right, can the other commissioners, if you can just unmute and we'll call the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the applicants may speak. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Mary Dierks, the preservation consultant for the project. Um, also in the Zoom is architect Gary Wiseman, who's here to answer questions. Um, as you recall, this is an application for a new facade along with vertical and rear extensions. Um, at the July hearing, commissioners' comments focused on refining the ornamental details, lightening the window structure and balconies, and shortening the limestone base. These changes have been made. I will go into more detail um, when we look at the uh, before the uh, previous and and, uh, and uh, next. As a reminder, this is what the building looks like today. It's this little one here. Um, this is how it was changed from the row house in um, uh, the 19th century row house to the building that you see today. Um, here is the uh, previously proposed and the currently proposed, the renderings. The limestone base is now one story high. The balconies are all steel. Um, the steel windows are the slimmest that you can get for steel windows. The side rosettes have been eliminated and the top cornice details have been refined. This is a full view of the proposed. Um, you'll note the uh, center windows, uh, they drop down um, to the level of the balcony. The balconies are at floor height. Um, here are the previous, the, uh, and the, the existing previous and currently proposed elevations. In this blow up, um, you can see the details of the brick coining, which has stayed the same, um, and the windows with the balconies. Um, there are louvers before the, below the first floor windows um, that they are in the form of perforated limestone panels with horizontal cutouts and a mesh grill behind. This is for fresh air for the cellar mechanical spaces. Um, here are the materials. Uh, they have not changed uh, brick and full brick and limestone and uh, black um, steel for the balconies. Um, here's a better photo of the um, of the proposed brick, and that's in front of the building um, to the right. It doesn't match, um, which we didn't want. Um, oh, and that's a lot, the limestone. But uh, we did want it to be compatible with. Uh, the building on the left um, has um, uh, limestone coins next to our building and a more orange brick. The existing and the proposed rear facade elevations haven't changed. Here's the site plan, which is the same. Um, here's the first floor plan. The, um, the uh, uh, entrance door is um, uh, fully open. Uh, the, the lobby uh, plan was changed so that um, there is no blind window as, as we had previously proposed, but it's, it's open and you can see through it. <coughs> just additional floor plans. Uh, this uh, section shows uh, a change from previously proposed, and that is uh, that we're proposing a, a, a sloped roof now instead of a, a flat roof, and that enables us to not have the stair bulkhead rise uh, above the, uh, the top roof. Uh, and you can't see, you couldn't see the old one from the street and you can't see this one from the street. And that's our presentation, thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? All right, not seeing any questions and um, just, we did not also receive any uh, additional written comments on this item. <clears throat> so if there are no questions, I think we can go right to our discussion. So I'm sending you all request to unmute. And, you know, the last time we saw this, uh, I think the, gen uh, the commissioners all unanimously agreed that the existing building could be enlarged with a new facade um, and 
for intents, all intents and purposes, a new building constructed here. And um, we're uh, comfortable with the stylistic approach, but did ask the applicants to think about doing a one-story base and to refine uh, and lighten up all of the details. Uh, which the applicants have done, and also to to uh, carefully think about the brick color as it relates to the other buildings in the streetscape. So we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Latfi, would you like to start this one? Sure. Um, happily, I want to thank the applicant for listening very attentively to um, our recommendations, and all of these refinements seem to work uh, nicely to make this a much more elegant project. Um, just reducing the base to one story and thinning out the steel windows and the balconies, you know, sit nicely and they're not imposing in any way. I think the those limestone um, perforated panels are also understated. Um, and the bulkhead wasn't visible, so that wasn't an issue really, but I appreciate the changes and, and eliminating the rosettes. The, the building has a very nice character and it fits well within the surrounding, uh, the building surrounding it now, and it, it makes sense within the, the district. So I can approve this. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Commissioner, yeah, Alfred Smith. Uh, yes, I also was not present for this oh. original <laughs> presentation, um, but uh, the improvements are are great, and I think um, you know, looking at what they started out with and what they're proposing today, I think the um, it's a much better proportioned um, the sort of the vertical coining going up the side and sitting in the brick spandrels and having the windows all go down to that same level makes it much more simple and elegant facade. And I, I think it's it's appropriate as is. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, I agree. It's, um, it's, it's, I was here for the first one. I think it's um, very nicely done. Uh, it's not having a termination of those second floor windows at the bottom seems a little awkward to me, but uh, if other commissioners don't find it uh, that to be the case, I can approve this as presented. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum? I think it's appropriate as drawn. Commissioner Devonshire? Yeah, well, well done, approvable. Okay. And Vice Chair Bland? Yeah, missed it first time around, but I think it's fine now. Okay, all right. So I think we all agree that the changes have improved it and it fits comfortably within this streetscape and within this historic district. So Commissioner Luffy, would you read the motion? Sure. In the matter of docket 22-08431-229 West 71st Street, West End Collegiate Historic District Extension. A row house built in 1884 and altered in 1946 to 1948 with a new facade attributed to Irving Kudroff. The application is to substantially demolish the existing building and construct a new building. I know that the building is not one for which the West End Collegiate Historic District Extension is designated and that the current building is a result of a 1946-1948 alteration that constructed a new facade at a plane aligned with the adjacent apartment houses. I recommend approval finding that the existing altered building is not one for which the historic district was designated. Therefore, the work will not eliminate a significant feature of the streetscape or historic district. That the existing streetscape consists of a range of building types and scales, including large apartment buildings on both sides of the proposed building. Therefore, the height and massing of the proposed building will be in keeping with the variety of buildings found on this block and will not overwhelm the streetscape or any green space at the center of the block. That the five-story facade with a setback, one-story penthouse and bulkhead will evoke the height and massing of, a small, of small apartment buildings historically found within the Upper West Side. That the 
proposed design of the new building will reflect a layering of various periods and styles consistent with other infill buildings and additions found throughout the district, that the materiality of the new building featuring a re red brickwork with coining, a one-story limestone tinted cast stone base with a granite sill, cast stone cornice, and black finished multi-light metal casement windows and French doors and decorative iron balconettes will harmonize with the materials and finishes of other buildings found on this block, that the penthouse and bulkhead will be only minimally visible from across the street and will feature simple massing materials and finishes consistent with penthouses typically found on apartment building roofs, that the inset reveals that the facade corners matching the existing facade condition will allow the corner details of the adjacent historic apartment buildings to be maintained and seen, that the solid to void ratio proportions and rhythm of the fenestration on the primary facade and non-visible rear facade relate to that of many historic and modern buildings in this historic district, and that the proposed building with enhanced special architectural and historic character, oh, yeah, character of the historic district. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Commissioner Chapin, which, or actually let's do Commissioner Holford Smith, would you second that motion? I second it. Okay, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Ludfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With seven in favor, none opposed, the motion passed. Thank you. Aye. Thank you, that's approved. And we'll move to the next item. Thank you, Commissioner. The next item is public meeting item number five, LPC 22-09533. This is an application for an amendment in the Borough of Manhattan, Block 40, Lot 3, 60 Wall Street. This is a postmodern style office tower designed by Roche Stankaloo and built in 1985 to 89, pursuant to a special permit under zoning resolution section 7479, which found a harmonious relationship between this building and the individual landmark at 55 Wall Street, which is a Greek revival style exchange building designed by Isaiah Rogers, built in 1842, with an addition designed by McKim, Mead, and White, and built in 1907. The application is to amend CR 85-004, LPC 84-0715 to alter the base of 60 Wall Street. This was last presented at the public hearing of June 28th, 2022. No action was taken at that time. Uh, we'll uh, turn it over to the applicants after we open the proceedings. Okay, thank you very much, Corey. Commissioner Devonshire, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the proceedings are opened and the applicant may speak. Thank you very much. And I believe, Hugh, you have the control so we can start the presentation. Um, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Thank you very hold much. On, hold on, we can't. Uh, can we allow, can you guys allow screen share for us? Sorry. Hugh, you need to click on your screen. Hugh, can you please? Click on yeah, your we're, we are attempting to do so, and we have. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot share start screen share while the other participant is sharing. You, so no, you will not be able to share your screen. You're going to present um, on this screen. So we have your presentation. You just need to click on your screen where you see the presentation is being shared, and then you will click through using. Got it. Do you see it? We do. Okay. Perfect. Now you have control. There you go. Excellent. My Thank apologies. You. All right. So good morning. Um, my name is Melanie Myers. I'm with Freed Frank and Land Use Council for the applicant. So as a reminder, the application before you is for a revised report relating to the harmonious relationship between 55 Wall Street and New York City Landmark and 60 Wall Street a late 1980s office building that received development rights from 55 Wall when originally built. Uh, 60 Wall is currently vacant and the exterior renovations being reviewed by the commission are part of a 
overarching improvement to the building that includes upgrades to the mechanical systems, upgrades, improvements to the lobby and interior pop space, and measures to include more transparency in the base of the building. At the public hearing in June, we received a number of thoughtful comments from the commissioners on the proposal, and in particular regarding the elements of 60 Wall Street that were important to establishing a harmonious relationship between the two buildings. And while the comments were varied, they generally focused on the project's colonnade, the profile and shadow lines of the building base at 60 Wall, and the relationship of the base of 60 Wall to the building as a whole. So we thank the commissioners for their input and consideration, and we appreciate the opportunity to show our response, which we believe improves the project and strengthens the relationship between 60 Wall and the landmark 55 Wall Street. I will now turn it over to Hugh Trumbull of KPF, and he will walk you through the proposed refinements. Okay. Uh, just to get everyone uh, located, here we are above uh, Manhattan looking down on 60 Wall Street and its neighboring property 55 that Melanie has talked about here. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, you see uh, what is really particularly important is the streetscape around uh, 60 Wall Street and the way that it embeds itself into the life of the city. Uh, there is an interesting aspect here in looking at it in, in that on the left hand, uh, there is a much more oblique view where the facade collapses. And then there's this one moment uh, at Hanover Street where you can see uh, directly uh, perpendicular to the facade. Next. Uh, we had uh, shown you the drawings, uh, black and white drawings of both the tower and podium and then details of the podium for the existing 60 wall. And then uh, in the next slide, you see uh, the, the original proposal that we had uh, presented earlier. And we will be talking about the adjustments to that design today. Uh, next, a little delay. Uh, one of the things that uh, we did really want to emphasize here is that we were um, very careful to try to make sure that the street wall is retained on the left image and that it the, the new proposal really fit into the street fabric. But that uh, on a Hanover type look at the building that you would see more depth that we allow our facades to have more of a performative aspect, getting light into the, the trading uh, floor spaces as well as, and more importantly, uh, the pop space deep within the building. Next. So there uh, were a number of uh, actually very uh, important and uh, telling comments that came back from um, our previous proposal. Uh, good thoughts about uh, strengthening and enhancing the proportion of the colonnade, giving it a bit more robustness, uh, increasing the shadow and depth uh, within the, the building to harmonize with uh, 55, and to think a little bit more about the relationship of the base of the building to the uh, existing conditions at the top of the, the tower, the shaft and the top of the tower. And we come here today with a number of uh, thoughtful responses. We, we believe they're thoughtful responses to these comments. Um, starting with the colonnade and the columns, uh, we have significantly uh, increased the size and dimension of the columns. We have looked at creating a double column as bookends, which is very similar to what happens at 55 across the way. And looking also at 55, we noticed how beautiful the spacing was, that it is all regular. And we have employed that in the design that you will be seeing um, uh, coming forward. Uh, in addition to, to address those issues of uh, shade and shadow, we've increased the cornice lines and developed details in the soffit. And then lastly, we uh, really dug in a little harder into the nuances and the detailing of the columns to bring a little bit more life and character uh, to the surfaces of the column material itself. Uh, next. So uh, this was the original proposal that we uh, uh, shared with you earlier. And then our new proposal that you have today, and you can see there's a much more robust uh, column design. The strength of those columns are uh, more emphatic. There's the pairing of the columns at that bookend either end of the facade uh, 
that heaviness is also uh, um, emphasized and, and put into the second uh, screen layer that's up above. If you go into the, the next image, uh, there's a bunch of, or there's a, a series of nuanced elements that we have added, those details that I talked about, uh, whether it's fluting within the column figure that you see at, at center, or even allowing the glass wall to, to slip down in the upper colonnade. So unifying the upper tower, using the cornices to uh, link it with the cornices that rise up through the existing building. So what we're going to do is walk through in a kind of step-by-step, uh, -step. we'll look at columns first and then other elements and we'll build up the facade so that you can see exactly how we've made the changes to the design. So going forward, uh, looking quite quickly at uh, 55 across the, the way, you see this beautiful order AAA all the way across and then the, the paired columns at the end. So then we're, we're bringing that over to our uh, 60 Wall Street uh, next. And just uh, to remind everyone here that there was a, a odd, odd bays that were in the original proposal for 60 that exists there today. And then in uh, the earlier proposal next, uh, you can see that we had also odd bays, but as we started to emphasize more robust columns, that this became a little bit awkward. And that led us to look at uh, 55 again. If you see the next slide, uh, you can see that ordering, taking all of the, the colonnade and making it an equivalent order, and we feel uh, makes a much more harmonious relationship to 55. And then implementing the bookends uh, down below, and it's not in this image, but that also occurs in the next layer up, and you'll see those in, in subsequent images to follow. Next. Uh, quick graphic that allows you to see the increased size of the column from the original proposal at, at the center down below to almost 50% more in terms of uh, stature uh, in dimension. And then on the, the 55 column and the existing column on either side of the page. Next. Uh, this is a kind of a, a quick study to show uh, the uh, columns have been uh, implemented here and the original and then the more robust columns and its adjustment. If we go on to the next line, um, we had another look, uh, continued to look at 55 and uh, the, particularly the cornice lines and the shadows uh, because we were asked to try to develop more shadow and character and depth in the facade. We, we looked at these cornice lines that are here, but we also looked at the way that the columns uh, touch the soffit as being an element. And we thought we could bring some of that character over to our proposed design. Next. Uh, this is the original series of uh, cornices that exist in 60, and then uh, some allocation to, to extend that cornice out about eight inches. If you go to the next slide, please. You can see uh, from the original proposal to our new that we have really taken that old cornice and brought it back into the proposal. We've extended out eight inches and we've created a lot more shadow and depth. And then small details on the underside of the soffit, you can start to see that there's additional detailing that's happening that mimics uh, some of the ways that the column comes up at 55 and addresses the, the underside surface. Next. And then uh, a quick image to show the original proposal with the uh, uh, now back and forth with the additional lines from those soffits and the detailing uh, on the underside. Uh, next. One of the things that we noted is that the uh, bringing the cornice line in, there's a series of kind of flying cornice elements as, it, as the tower stacks up on the shaft that reaches up to the, the very top of the tower. So this cornice line um, is just sort of further ties those elements together uh, from this oblique view as you look up to the tower. Next. Uh, and then here you can see our interest in adding that little extra detail that is 
kind of sympathetic to what happens across the street at 55, where you're, when you're looking at the underside of things, there's a, there's a bit of richness and you see that as the way that the column comes up and hits the soffit as well as the, the detailing in the cornice lines themselves. Next. Uh, this is a bit of a strange view. It's a fabricated view. You never can see it like this. We're kind of down in the earth. We removed the building behind us, which is 55, just so that we could look up in the facade. This is the original proposal. And then if you go to the next slide, you see the adjustments. You see the strength of the new columns that have been put in. You see the book ending. You can see how that book ending starts to stack up as you go from one screen level to the next screen level, mimicking what happened with the Kimmy Mean White adding to the building. And then that pairing rising up to the top of the tower. And then at center stage, the glass is allowed to kind of slip down behind uh, the screen wall at the first level uh, and, and interlock uh, the, the, the old and the new design together. So it seems seamless. Uh, next. Uh, and we have produced this for you, which is the equivalent series of drawings that uh, were uh, sim similar to the ones that you saw before, uh, showing the more robust columns in the design here. Next. Uh, in addition, uh, this series of slides begins to look at the detailing of the columns. So in the original proposal, uh, it was a fairly minimalist column. Uh, this is the enlarged size with that style of combs. And then what we're suggesting today is that uh, we brought a series of elements that, uh, and that, that give the column more texture and interest and maybe a little bit more classical detailing in its nature. The ground plane swells up to create a plinth base for the column to sit down on. We've employed uh, fluting similar to what happens at 55. We've worked on some sort of very subtle minimal details to give it a bit of a, a, a foot and a capital to it. We've broken the line of the column at the third story so that it does uh, have a more classical stacked quality to it as it moves up uh, and um, becomes part of the, the architecture. Here again, you can see it on the oblique view, which again is what we think something that is quite quite important. Important. You can see the fluting and how there's a kind of a, a dialogue between the two facades when that is employed. Uh, next, and then to get to a bit of the materiality, uh, the street has a very tight nature in terms of all of the subtleties of beiges and grays that. That occupy the, seat, the street, we want to fit right into that. Uh, next, uh, this is the palette uh, that we have. Uh, we're thinking about the Jura uh, limestone, really working quite beautifully with our neighboring buildings to either side of us. Uh, very tight palette that runs all the way through. Uh, next. And then uh, the next series of slides, just to uh, kind of finish off, is a comparative. A uh, series of perspectives that allow you to see the changes and the adjustments that we have made to in, uh, make a much more harmonious uh, uh, relationship with 55, bringing in some of the very thoughtful comments that the commissioners have brought to the table here. You see it on the uh, perpendicular view and how that fluting gives a little bit more interest and focus uh, into the architecture, but also allows for the transparency to occur into the public space beyond. Uh, the next series of slides really look at the streetscape, this, this time from uh, the, the west or the east looking west, and then uh, how that uh, the columns become a little bit more robust. So lastly, I'd just like to say that I think that uh, we had uh, some very important goals to improving the, the building. I think we received some very thoughtful comments, which we have been able to incorporate into the design in a way that uh, I think allows the, the building to uh, really carry through on more active street front, uh, and more life in terms of engaging the public space into the sidewalk, but uh, keeping the nature of the street, keeping the harmonious relationship with 55, uh, and really uh, believe that this will be a great improvement, improvement to the, the neighborhood and to the city as a whole. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? 
before we begin a discussion. All right, I'm not seeing any questions. So let me first start by acknowledging that we received um, letters from the Historic Districts Council, the New York Landmarks Conservancy, Docomomo, and Community Board One, and from 13 individuals in advance of today's public meeting. And those were all shared with the commissioners. Um, we also received an email from Council Member Marte and two individuals today that missed the deadline and were not shared with the commissioners before today. Um, and I just wanna remind everyone that we welcome comments on revised proposals that are presented at public meetings, but we must receive them by noon the Monday before the public meeting to ensure that they're made available to the commissioners before they review the application. Um, but as I said, the, uh, the other four, uh, 17 letters have been shared with the commissioners. And commissioners, as you recall, when we last saw this application on June 28th, um, we discussed that the agency at the time had just received a request to evaluate both the interior and the exterior of the building. And at that public hearing, the commissioners present didn't find that the proposed changes to the base were harmonious with the facade at 55 Wall Street and that the resulting disconnect between the base and the tower in itself was not harmonious with 55 Wall Street, which has a very uniform design throughout. And so we, we took no action and we asked the applicant to restudy the design in terms of the some of the deep adding level of detail, articulation, depth, and substance to the uh, elements to create a better or more harmonious relationship, or to look at more modest changes to the exterior, existing exterior facade of the base. And since that public hearing, um, the research department has carefully reviewed the material submitted with the requests for evaluation. Uh, for the interior and the exterior, and they've done initial, additional initial research and comparative analysis. Um, they've to date noted that the postmodern office building designed by Kevin Roche, John Dinklew and Associates and built in 1983 to 89 is known for its distinctive massing and synthesis of abstracted classicizing forms with modern technology and its reference to other early 20th century skyscrapers nearby. But they also noted that this is an error of architecture only recently reaching the age eligible for consideration as landmarks and that further in-depth study and comparative analysis would be needed to determine merit for designation. And the research staff is working on that study and I hope conclusions can be reached in the near future Sure. Um, but um, and we've told the applicant that notwithstanding an approval from the commission, the commission can still consider designation. So having said all of that, we have a pending application before us and we are required to act within a reasonable time frame. So we will have to address the application today based on the criteria under the law that we determine that, that requires that we determine there be a harmonious relationship. And um, there are a couple of ways that you can look at this. One is you can consider this as a proposal as if it's the first time and the application is, uh, and that the uh, design that's being proposed is for a new building that would uh, receive for the first time uh, the transfer of development rights. And we'd be looking to see if there was a harmonious relationship between the proposed uh, revised building and 55 Wall Street. And then if you determine that the changes they've made today address the concerns raised at the hearing, you can vote to approve. If you don't feel the changes are adequate and don't address your concerns for a level of articulation and depth, then you can ask for more revisions. Or alternatively, you can, because the existing building is uh, and was designed in the context of an LPC review of harmonious relationship, you can also consider whether the proposed revised design is more or less harmonious with the existing design. So normally when we are reviewing appropriateness, it's not a question of whether something is more appropriate or less appropriate, it's whether it's appropriate. Um, but in this case, because the commission's review had uh, the commission's 
process had uh, had influenced the design of the existing building, one can consider that as as they as you think about the question of harmonious relationships. So you can think about this as if you were seeing this for this new building was the first building and whether it has a harmonious relationship and whether the changes made today respond to your concerns. Um, or you can think about it, compar it, comparing it to the relationship that the existing building has with 55 Wall Street, if that makes sense. So um, we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Devonshire, would you like to start this one? I believe the relationship is harmonious enough to be approvable, and I'm I'm on board with it. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair Bland. Wow, that was so fast. Um, <laughs> I have I think more to say. First of all, I just want to um, go on public record as saying that Fifty Five is one of my all time favorite buildings in the city. Uh, its uh, addition by uh, Charles McKim is a classic way of adding new to old that is not a, a, an invisible rooftop addition that doesn't call attention to itself. It does. It makes a new building. It's an extraordinary building in any and all of its history. And it's one of the great places to eat outdoors. If you want a, a, a quick idea of what it must be like to eat on the porch of the Pantheon, go have uh, lunch there. So I really admire the building, um, 55. Um, secondly, I sort of am challenged by the notion of harmonious relationship itself. And I think many of the buildings on Wall Street, along Wall Street, have a harmonious relationship with this building and have had over its course of history which has been a long one with many different kinds of buildings on this street, some very small. One, of course, now existing in its facade alone in the, uh, in the, at the Metropolitan Museum in the, uh, in the American Wing. Um, so there are many ways of being harmonious, not just creating, um, uh, you know, in some form, a contemporary form, uh, columns. Um, so I'm a little bit troubled by what all that, that means. But the bigger picture for me is, and this is why I'm not able to find this appropriate now, is the whole um, uh, taking a part of the bottom of a building by Kevin Roach, an important American architect, a very important American architect, um, and uh, you know, and creating a whole new base for it. And I say this with some um, r respect for what, for instance, has, is being done or has been done or will be done uh, to Philip Johnson's AT&T building of about 10 years before, but nonetheless a so-called postmodern building where changes have been made uh, and had been voted on as appropriate by this commission but the changes are much more respectful and restrained in terms of the original design. And that's where I part with this. Um, I'm a great admirer of many of KPF's works, um, but I just cannot find that the uh, disembowelment, if you will, of, of Kevin Roach's building with this tacked onto the base uh, and that, for me, that would include the interiors, but I know that at the moment, at least, we're not, we're not um, um, really able to comment on the interiors of the atrium space, which I also admire and find uh, in its current sad state of affairs, of course it's gloomy, but if you look at the beautiful original pictures and transport yourself back in time to a time in the 80s when this kind of architecture uh, was in vogue, I think that can also be made to be a beautiful and appropriate um, uh, way to uh, remarket this building. So a lot said there, some of which is maybe germane and some of it a little off mark, but I just wanted to make my, my comments uh, known in context, and, um, but I cannot ap approve this as having 
necessarily a harmonious relationship with 55, or if it's appropriate or not appropriate, I'm not sure, with the building itself, uh, the, the tower above. So there I am. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. Commissioner Lutfi here. I'm not unmuted, sorry. So, sorry about that. Um, thank you, Fred, for those comments. Um, I really appreciate them. I, I um, though, think that the changes of on this building actually work quite well. And, um, you know, they're all, in a way, they're, they're small moves, but I think that they help to, and I, I'm not even gonna use the word harmonious because I think that that, you know, that is a question, questionable wor word, but, uh, but do these two buildings now speak to each other and do they live, can they live together in a way that makes sense? And if you go to page 46, I mean, the you know, um, of the, if we could look at that in the presentation, I, I think that, you know, if I'm picturing myself walking down the street or standing at the, at the, the top of the street and looking down, I do feel like, um, is that 46? No. 36. Well, yeah, 46, I think I was looking. For. Maybe 36. Um, the one where you're looking at both, both across the street from each other, it's- 39. 39, 30, maybe? 37, maybe. No. Try 37. Yeah. No, no. No, it's, that brings it's, different. It's the, it's the yeah. Then I, you know, then I'm looking at then then what I saw. Sorry, it has a, a row uh, of five. On one side. Five thirty-five. And, no, is that it? No, that's not it. No, those are the side by side. Okay, I think all right. Maybe the applicant, yeah, the applicant yeah. can continue yeah. to try to find yeah. side by side, but yeah. you go ahead, Commissioner. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, the point was that I think that they sit very nicely together, and I do think these refinements um, help the project a lot. And I am sympathetic to this. I remain sympathetic to this notion that we have to make um, our office buildings work so that they are marketable, but we need to do it in a way that retains the, the architectural integrity of the original building and speaks to um, the environment around it, which I think that these changes do. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Holford-Smith. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I agree completely with uh, Fred's comments. Um, I don't find that this has a harmonious relationship either to the landmark or to the, the building above. Um, and um, I, I think it certainly has a much less harmonious relationship than the original uh, existing uh, design does. And so I cannot, I can't support this application. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chapin? Yeah, I expected to be alone today, so I'm uh, pleased to hear Commissioner Bland and Commissioner Holford Smith's comments. Um, mindful that neither the interior or the exterior of the current uh, uh, bases is landmarked, uh, I thought I had to look at it as whether or not. Um, not as you expressed the chair, which was also helpful as whether it's an improvement or not, but whether it was harmonious. But kind of on both scores, I find that it doesn't, it doesn't meet uh, what I think would uh, constitute really being harmonious. And I, I do not think it's an improvement on the current uh, uh, design and, and structure. They have increased, I think, 
harmony with the increase in the pillars, the shadow lines, the adding the setting blocks, the fluting, the reveal, and the closest uh, that they come to achieving some harmony is this view that we're looking at now. But I think from a perpendicular view shows how much it doesn't in the sense that the lower, that which is 37 or so, which is shows how the lower level still seems very light, the weight and horizontality that you see in the, in, uh, the slide 12, which shows 15's design and 13, which shows the existing, has, has a much greater sense of mass at the bottom, horizont, horizont, horizontal rigor, so to speak. And one of the other things we really haven't talked about during the discussion, there's, there's a sense of monumental entrance, both in 55 and in, um, maybe a monumental is an exaggeration, but a solid structural entrance, both in, 50, in 55 Wall Street and in the Rush Denkolo uh, version of this. And I think those things all are very much part of, for me, what constitutes a, the sense of uh, harmonious relationship here. So I can't uh, prove it as, uh, as presented. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Goldblum. Well, isn't this an interesting discussion? Mm -hmm. um, um, wow. Well, let's let's see. I mean, my view is is that I've I've always struggled with the definition of the term a harmonious relationship. I think that in looking at the, the, the zoning text um, in the abstract, my understanding, and I know that this is perhaps not shared by, by others, uh, my understanding of the way it reads is that the code is, the code is offering extra you know, forgiveness from certain zoning regulations in, in trade for basically an improved relationship with either an individual, with an individual landmark in this case. And usually that, that has to do with either something that's being added onto it or something that's right next to it. And that's, it's kind of pointing towards contextual relationships. Now in this building, uh, we have two things going on. One, we have a historic building that's literally across the street in a district that is characterized by very narrow streets with very high street walls that create a cavernous quality, a dark shaded quality to the streets, to the streetscape with very plainer buildings that rise fairly straight up from the, from the uh, property line. Uh, in a pre-zoning fashion. And that the building in question, 55 wall, was and is an exception to that urban typology as a low building, as a monumental building that has depth uh, as opposed to a skin building. And, um, you know, as a kind of a feature building as opposed to a ground building. So how do you relate harmoniously to that? I think that the, the knee-jerk answer is to create background-esque buildings, but buildings that match with the typology of the district more broadly so that the building can be seen in the way it was intended to be seen, namely in a context of you know, fairly dense street wall developments. Uh, I don't think that the existing building did that at all. I think the existing building was a kind of neo art deco pile that, that descended back in stages in a, uh, a very heavy manner um, that, and that, that sought to introduce a colonnade in a district that doesn't have a whole lot of colonnades. Um, and it was seeking to make itself distinctive, not to blend in per se. And, I can't speak for the commission at the time that approved this, the 74, 711 or whatever the, the procedure was. The, the, uh, um, 
I, I don't, I don't know if I would have felt that the existing building was particularly harmonious with this building through that way of looking at it. So here we are today. Is this as good as the last one or is it better? I think that it's worse in two ways. So I guess I'm falling in the Diana, Fred uh, um, camp, uh, Anne. I think it's worse first because it's, it's increasing the, the degree of porosity and even over the, the, the landmark building itself, which is remarkably more porous than its surroundings. Uh, it is much less massive than both what preceded it on this site and the subject building. And I think the massiveness um, created a, 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 a relationship. And that has to do sure. with not just the, the girth of the columns, but their spacing. Right. One of the most impressive aspects of 55 is the dense spacing of columns. It, it's it's not it's not open and airy. It's rhythmic and intense and solid. And I think that this building's openness and airiness kind of feels disharmonious both to the neighborhood and to the building it's supposed to relate to. So I don't think it restores the urban fabric. Uh, pre Roach Dinkaloo, and I don't think it creates a an effective dialogue with the building across the street. Uh, that's number one. Number two, in in its in I think making it worse is that it doesn't very successfully, in my view, relate to the building that it's sitting under. So if the building that it's sitting under is basically a legacy within the district, where an earlier determination by the commission said that yes, this particular design is, is uh, harmonious enough to merit uh, uh, that finding. I think that by striving very mightily to distance itself from the building above, even though there are little elements like the cornice profile that, that it carries over, it's definitely a different flavor. It's definitely a 2022 flavor as opposed to a 1984 flavor. It's crisp, it's rectilinear, it's modern, it's, it's relatively ahistoric, it's, it's very geometric, and it, it, it's kind of playing on a kind of sense of proportion that is totally different from that which is above, plus it's got different materials than, than, than the building above. So I think that in that regard also, it's creating a third entity here, right? There's the historic building, there's the building, you know, there's, there's the tower, the Roach Dinkaloo Tower, and then there's this, and how does that, as, a, as an urban ensemble, create harmony? I'm not sure that, you know, as, as vague and, and hard to pin down a word as that is, I don't think it does it. So I, I, would, I would agree with uh, Anne and Fred and Diana that, that this doesn't rise to that level. And I do wanna say that um, you know, in terms of the comments that you made about the interior and, and the, the, the potential review of that for consideration. I do think it, it merits that, that review and that we should work with the applicant to make sure that it doesn't um, get, um, get effaced before that review can be made. Okay, all right. So I wanna thank all of you for your thoughtful comments today. I think this is a, a very challenging application. Um, you know, we have approved lots of um, 70, but lots of transfer of development rights um, where we have to find a harmonious relationship. Generally, for the most part, we do that between the base of the new building that's off the landmark site with the landmark from which the development rights are coming. Um, and I think that um, we have uh, approved um, you know, we, we don't normally do a, an appropriateness review. It's a, it's, you know, is there a harmonious relationship? And that has allowed us, I think, flexibility to approve a number of different approaches. And, um, and I think at first blush, you know, the proposed design may be consistent with some of those others that we have approved in terms of finding that relationship in terms of the columns. But the, you know, the, the fact is that we, as an agency, we're involved with the 
original design. And I, that's why I wanted to make it clear that we could also think about what's successful in the original design and how um, that factors into your thoughts about what is harmonious here. And so I think um, thinking about the, the elements of the existing design and what was successful and how I think can put a different lens on the new uh, design that we're looking at today in terms of that relationship and really thinking about what, what made it really harmonious and is this as harmonious understanding that context. Um, and then of course, the fact that the base uh, doesn't relate any longer to the top, even though there's some efforts were made to connect them. Um, I think is an issue that came up at our public hearing and continues to be an issue for many commissioners. It is clear that at 55 wall, even with the later addition, it is very uniform um, and sort of and has a, uh, sort of an entire design aesthetic throughout. And so I think having a new building that doesn't have a consistent design of materials throughout it is in itself still a, a problem for finding that harmonious relationship for many commissioners. So I think where we are is we uh, don't have the support for the design as proposed today. So we'll there, take- Sarah? Action. Yep, sorry. I just wanted to know whether Wellington has joined us. I'm not sure when he joined <laughs> us and whether he, he wanted to make any comment before you just sort of moved on just for the record. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, Mark. Uh, I, my apologies because I, my uh, meeting has indicated that I joined in uh, slightly right after 12 o'clock. So I did not get to see the presentation. So I would defer to the judgment of the rest of the commissioners. All right, Sarah, just wanna make sure. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so I think um, at any rate, we don't have uh, enough uh, people comfortable with the, the harmonious relationship yet between the proposed work and 55 Wall Street. So we will take no action today and the applicants can consider their options and continue to talk to the staff. So um, we will, uh, this will conclude the item today. And I think that we are um, a little, again, behind schedule. So I wanna just check and see we're, we're actually 30 minutes ahead of schedule, but okay. I, we don't have our applicants. So I if, got if it. That's lunch, what it was. That would be best. Okay. I, I got the message about breaking for lunch. I thought we were behind. Okay. So <laughs> we're actually ahead, but we don't have our applicants. So we'll break for our lunch now and we will return at one o'clock. And by then we will have our uh, next applicants and we'll be able to move through the rest of the afternoon. So we'll ask all members of the public to voluntarily leave the meeting so that if you do wanna come back, you don't have technical issues coming back that might arise if we remove you. And um, we will see everyone back at 102. Thank you.